Alberto Montanari, it's a pleasure today for me to chair the first part of this session. I already apologize because unfortunately in the second part of the session I'll have to leave before the end because I have to introduce also a public lecture at the Natural Museum in Vienna. And I, I want to apologize because really I think that um, I am very interested in uh, these uh, discussions, in these events, uh, and uh, I am interested in attending uh, all what is possible. And uh, there is to say that during this week uh, there were several events concentrating on diversity and equality of opportunities. I, I will talk about them in, uh, in my very short presentation. Today the session is a union session called the title, the Promoting and Supporting Equality of Opportunities in Geosciences. This is a session that has been organized several times in EGU in the past five years, and this year it's a union session. It's a union session because we thought that we, uh, we wanted to promote the session at the union level to enlighten it among our most important symposium and discussions. It's uh, co-sponsored by AGU and JPGU. I'm very pleased of that. I think it is an important message that these uh, scientific associations get together to strengthen the message. The conveners are, besides myself, uh, the main convener is Claudia Halvest de Jesus Ridin. She's uh, sitting in the first row. Robin Bell, AGU president, also sitting here. Chiaki Oguchi, representative from JPGU, thank you very much for being here. And uh, also, I, I, I'm uh, emotional to make a mention to Lily Pereg. Uh, she uh, was a co-convener of this session. Unfortunately, she deceased uh, in January for a tragic accident. So I think it's also time today to address uh, our thoughts to, to her, to her memory. So I'm uh, uh, delivering a short introduction and to summarize what the EGU is doing together with sister associations uh, in, uh, in uh, the context of uh, diversity and equality of opportunity. Since 2014, uh, we collect uh, gender data on nomination and awards, uh, and we are also collecting uh, data regarding geographical distribution on nominations and awards. Since 2016, as I said, a session with the same title as today's sessions, Promoting and Supporting Equality in the Geosciences, is organized here at the EGU General Assembly by a spontaneous group of persons. In 2018, a dedicated splinter meeting was organized, resulting in a series of action that this spontaneous group proposed to EGU Council. And as a result of these suggestions, in fall 2018, the EGU Council decided to create a working group on diversity and equality. It will work across the other EGU committees to advise Council on strategic actions to address equality of opportunity and diversity with, uh, in our aim, a very broad vision. We would like to embrace diversity and equality of opportunity in its uh, entire context. A few words on the strategy that EGU is adopting. First of all, awards and medals are approved by Council. The, our committees only make a selection, a preliminary selection, that results in a series of uh, nominations. And this gives us the opportunity to have an overall picture of the awards that are given in, uh, in any year. And therefore, the Council can, monitors, can monitor for biases of any type. This is, uh, again, I think, essential, because uh, I think it's possible to marry criteria based on the merit with the need of ensuring equality of opportunities, as we'll say later. And then we have a program to train EGU officers on unconscious bias. We couldn't finalize it yet because uh, it's, um, ideally we would like to couple it with a council meeting and then we are, we are 
we are thinking of the best date, the best opportunity for us in order to take uh, the max profit from it. And then uh, we started, as many other sister associations, to name medals and awards after women. We also renamed an award, a medal, in order to uh, couple the name, uh, the original name, uh, the name uh, of uh, a man with the name of a woman. We support events focusing on diversity and equality to raise awareness and promote constructive discussions. And then we encourage balanced nominations. As I said, it's possible, as you see the last statement, to couple the criteria based on merit with uh, the aim of ensuring equality of opportunities. Now, we also encourage diversity of convener teams. We encourage diversity among speakers for career stage. And this is stated explicitly in our guidelines for each oral block include at least two early career scientists. Also, uh, we, uh, we proposed quiet rooms for people who need some time for themselves, a breastfeeding room, free childcare. And uh, I'm pleased to say that this year the free childcare was much, much used by several attendants and two multi-faith prior rooms. And any, uh, partici every participant needs to accept at registration the rules of conduct. Violation can be reported, as usual, by sending emails. These are our statistics. Uh, we started in 2014, as I said. In the past five years, we received 975 nominations for all the division and union medals and early career scientist recognition. Overall, 22% of the nominees were female. And if we look at the medalists and awardees, in terms of people that were actually awarded, the percentage is 21%. So there is really a slight difference. We think it's in, in the range of the uncertainty between the percentage of nominations and percentage of awardees, which means that we have indeed to encourage nominations. And we already started doing that. The geographical distribution is not optimal. We are working on that. Now, let's look at uh, 2019. I think it's important. It is almost my last, last slide because uh, it proves uh, the result of our actions that were overall quiet. But still, you can see that we received uh, 177 nominations for this year awards. And 30 plus, more than 30% of them were female scientists in terms of nomination. And we write here the magic 30% because this was our first target. And 35% uh, of this year awardees uh, uh, are female. And three out of four Arne Richter Award for early career scientists are women. So it's an increase. Uh, if you look at the picture of uh, that was taken yesterday of our division, uh, uh, division medalists, you see that there is indeed diversity. I was very pleased afterwards that a person approached me and said it was a really nice and diverse stage. Okay, so these are our, uh, our initiatives. Uh, we started collecting data on authorship of uh, the various contributions that are submitted to EGU. We are promoting this union symposium, plus another ordinary session, diversity and equality in the geosciences, again, co-sponsored by AGU, EAG, and JPGU. We adopted pronoun pin buttons, you have seen there, probably, in, in the desk, in the, in the main desk at the, at the entrance of the building. And also, we uh, produced Pride EGU pin buttons and the pop-up pop event for early career scientists and networking in the networking zone. And also we had a diversity reception Tuesday, which was very well attended. So this is the result of our efforts and the efforts that are continuing. And of course, the purpose of this event is also to collect your suggestions. With that, I'm pleased to start the session by calling into the floor the first speaker. Erika, Marine Spiotta, please, Erika.
and the, the title of the contribution on behalf of uh, several co-authors is Institutional and Cultural Change to Advance Diversity in the Geosciences uh, through Partnership. Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to come um, and talk at this session. I want to acknowledge my team of uh, co-authors and collaborators. So we were asked to briefly introduce ourselves before our talk, and so I'm a professor of geography at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and I'm usually looking at um, carbon dynamics in soils and landscape disturbance effects on biogeochemical cycles, and usually I like to come to scientific conferences to talk about my scientific research, and I am later this week. Um, but throughout the session today, um, I actually want, want us, like, if we're successful, I think we'll leave this room feeling uncomfortable. And I hope we feel uncomfortable about the status quo. And I hope we feel uncomfortable that there are a lot of people who can actually spend their time and passion doing the research that they really want to be doing, because every day or every week, they're made to feel like they don't belong in science. So, let's figure out which direction it goes. It's very sensitive. Okay. So, I want to acknowledge, and in, in my title, I talked about building partnerships. And, and I want to acknowledge that we can't do any of this work on our own. Um, and we're more effective when we collaborate and when we build partnerships among different institutions. Um, and bring our strengths together. And so I want to acknowledge that I've been very fortunate to work with a team of people. Um, you know, I've been on the board of the Earth Science Women's Network um, over the years, um, and you see some of the members pictured here. And I also want to acknowledge some individuals at the top that a lot of you here in the room who go to the American Geophysical Union will recognize, especially two staff members, Billy Williams and Pranodi Asher. Um, and the American Geophysical Union is so lucky to, to have these two leaders um, as part of their, their society. There we go. Okay. So in addition to my work on carbon biogeochemistry and geography, um, I am currently leading a National Science Foundation funded uh, large partnership award through the advanced program. And you can see here we've got um, collaborators all across the US. And we're also partnering with American Geophysical Union, the Association for Women Geoscientists, and um, the Earth Science Women's Network. And what is this project doing? Well, the first thing we're doing is, you know, at the end of the day, we are scientists, so we like to collect data, even though actually when you talk to sociologists and psychologists, they tell us that they already have enough data on the things that we're interested in. But we're interested in figuring out people's experiences in the workplace, in the geosciences. So we're going to be conducting a workplace climate survey. We're also developing and delivering bystander intervention training with scenarios that are relevant to the geosciences and that incorporate the especially vulnerable experiences with people that are at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities. We're developing teaching modules that identify harassment as research misconduct, and ultimately the goal, and NSF would like us to succeed in developing a sustainable model that can be transferred to other disciplines in partnership with professional societies. So I want to show a little bit of data, and the data is US-centric, um, because that's where I come from. But looking around, I don't think it's very different uh, in Europe. And we might see some, some European data in, from other parts of the world later on in this session. But across geoscience departments in the US, women make up 20% of faculty. We make up a little over 30% of the science workforce in the United States, and we make up 50% of the adult age you know, working age population in the US. So an underrepresentation. There's been a little bit of an increase in the last 10 years, but at this rate, it's gonna take 50 years to achieve parity. And you can say we've actually been waiting long enough. Women still dominate the most vulnerable positions. These are the unsecured, non-permanent positions. And some of the increases we have seen, especially in the last 10 years in women, are really only white women. We actually look at the data of women of color in the United States. They are remarkably, embarrassingly, shockingly, still very, very low um, in the single digits. And this leads to increased you know, professional isolation uh, and vulnerability to some of the behaviors we're going to be talking about today. 
And actually, if we look at the trends of other types of diversity, racial and ethnic diversity, despite multiple efforts to increase recruitment, increase retention, we actually have seen no advance, no progress in 40 years in the geosciences. And I expect that's pretty similar uh, in Europe as well. So clearly, we have a problem. And so a lot of people like to talk about the leaky pipeline, right? The idea is that you know, the numbers of women um, kind of attrition as you go up in professional levels. And basically, you know, if we wait enough, we'll have you know, the younger generation move up. And I actually think this is a pretty faulty metaphor for several reasons. First of all, it implies that there's one pipeline, right? There's only one way to get to the finish. There's only one way of being a scientist. And we know there's a lot of different ways. There's actually on-ramps and off-ramps. Um, and we should be able, you know, we should, we should be accept accepting of all those different pathways. It's also a very passive model, right? It assumes like you're going through the pipeline, oop, there's a hole, like drip out, right? And first of all, nobody likes to be called a drip. And it also assumes, well, you know, if we want to get more women out of the end of the pipeline, let's just force a lot more water with pressure, right? And the more we put in, the more we stuff in, the more we'll get out. Um, but really, it's not a passive pipeline, right? There's a lot of active behaviors that are leading to the underrepresentation of people of color and women, not only the geosciences, but in all scientific disciplines and in academia more general. And this is a long list of research studies that have demonstrated active discrimination and implicit bias. Um, the blue references indicate geoscience-specific research, and it basically cuts through all different levels um, and it affects quality of mentoring. You know, people of color and women are not getting the same access to good mentoring. Their CVs with different names, um, you know, their CVs are basically based and rated on the name, not on the quality. Um, they're getting fewer resources to begin with, lower salary, and you can see down the line. There's also a lot of hostile behaviors that people have to experience daily. Some data from the US, we've got two thirds of US higher education employees witness or experience bullying recently in the workplace. Two thirds of bullying targets are women. We have more than half of uh, geoscience women in the survey experience sexual harassment in the workplace. We have more than two thirds of undergraduate women and half of female faculty in the US are sexually harassed at work. And from recent surveys, we also know that 71% you know, of women doing field work, and in the geosciences, a lot of us spend a lot of time in the field, and a lot of us actually enter the geosciences because we love being in the field, experienced inappropriate comments, and 26% experienced sexual assault. And we know that some communities, remember the data, right? We have very low digits of representation of people of color in the geosciences and no progress in the last 40 years. And we know that if you have you know, people with multiple marginalized identities feel disproportionate impact. Some data from the astrophysics community show that 40% of women of color compared to 20% of white women felt unsafe due to their gender. 28% of women of color felt unsafe due to their, their race. And this resulted in people skipping professional events. So we see it's not only you know, a mental health consequence, but there's a strong professional consequence. People are not participating fully in the pursuit of science because they feel unsafe. And so I think the problem is that we treat our data better than our people. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we can do to address this. And the first thing we need to do as scientists is actually learn our history. Um, if we think about the history of many of our academic and scientific institutions in Europe, but especially in the US, they have some pretty unfriendly and very exclusive histories based on colonialism, patriarchy, even white supremacy. And we have to think about how do our current institutional structures, practices, and behaviors continue to exclude the people that they were built to exclude. There's a lot we need to do to actually reconfigure, recreate our academic and scientific institutions. And we need to be aware of this. And part of this awareness um, actually should come from education. And I actually have a tweet in here um, that just came out yesterday. There was an article in Science kind of rec recognizing 
the role of the slave trade in advancing European science, which is a really important recognition, but the way the article was written was actually very insensitive and actually um, you know, very disrespectful. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done in, in, in acknowledging and recognizing this history. And part of that, I think we need to redesign our science education. Um, scientists need to learn history of science. They need to learn history of where they're living. We need to learn um, about you know, gender in women's and race studies and, and how different communities um, experience discrimination, not only in society, but also in science. And I wanna point out that Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein has a really good resource of references and think, starting to think Right, just starting to think about decolonizing science. We also need to acknowledge that science is political, and there's a huge debate in the United States about this right now. And the truth is that science, at least Western science, right, is, is described as the pursuit of knowledge. Knowledge is power, and power is politics. Therefore, the pursuit of knowledge is a political action, right? And who gets to pursue knowledge who doesn't get to pursue knowledge, where and what resources they have are all political acts. More closely, we can think about disincentivizing unethical behavior. And this is also political, right? It's very political how, you know, who gets to decide who's penalized for different behaviors or not. And academic institutions we know are loath to penalize um, people for misconduct if they're bringing in fame, if they're bringing in resources to universities. That's a political statement, and we need to change that. We also need to reinvent mentoring, especially in the sciences, and especially in the model like the US, where, where students are dependent on their advisor for funding, which is their salary, access to resources, access to healthcare, um, housing, etc. We need to come up with models of uh, multiple mentors and thinking about more independent funding for students and postdocs. So funding agencies need to be involved in this work. We also need to make safety a number one priority. And we don't do that. And that survey of uh, sexual harassment in the field actually highlighted that. The fact that most people who are being sexually assaulted or receiving inappropriate comments in the field did not know where to go. They did not know what to do. There was no policy in place. And so we can't be sending students to conferences or to the field without thinking about not just what happens when they get stung by a poisonous snake if you work in some tropical area, right, or if you twist your ankle, but what happens when you're being threatened by the people around you or the people you're working with. We really need to make safety our number one priority. We think about how to safeguard our data, but we really don't think about how to safeguard our people. And so societies here have a responsibility, and I'm very pleased to see that both the European Geosciences Union and the American Geosciences, I'm sorry, Geophysical Union, and then societies all across disciplines right now are, are realizing and accepting this responsibility. And one responsibility is to educate. Re scientific societies have the responsibility to educate their leadership, their members, but also society about some of the challenges that people experience in science. Um, and for example, I'm, I just have some resources here from the American Geophysical Union because I've been working more closely with them. They have an online resources portal with resources to think about harassment. Um, and I believe Jill Karsten later is going to be talk about, talking about initiatives for broader, supporting broader diversity as well. Um, scientific societies have the responsibility to provide training for their staff and their membership on bias. At the American Geophysical Union, we're providing training on bystander intervention to deal with harassment and, uh, and bullying as well through their academic heads and chairs and to the broader society. Society ethics policies need to conduct behavior beyond meetings, right? They need to regulate. And that's actually professional societies were built, were developed, were created to regulate professional conduct. And so they need to continue that historical legacy with clear guidelines for reporting and investigation, but also sanctions. So many scientific society codes of conduct tell you how not to behave, but they don't actually say what happens to you if you break that code of conduct, and that's really important. There needs to be transparency so membership knows what's happening. And also societies need to support their membership, especially their most vulnerable communities 
Um, and I'm very excited, the, the American Geophysical Union just launched a new ethics and equity center, and one of the resources they provide is free legal advice to early career um, researchers. The AGU also um, established a new uh, ethics policy, and I was on that task force that developed the language for this, and is one of the first societies to actually make a really strong stand to define discrimination, bullying, and all types of harassment as scientific misconduct, and actually put it into place already. And they've already rescinded awards, and other societies are actually looking at AGU as role models. And we've actually seen kind of a wave of this being adopted across disciplines as well as across uh, oceans. But also, the American Geophysical Union, you might not know this, but they identify key principles for student advisor relationships based on respect. So they're really thinking about professional conduct more broadly, right? And, and originally, ethics code of con the ethics policy was really all about data, right? Again, we're scientists, we work with data, right? We don't work with people. No, actually, we do work with people, and we need to treat our people well. We need to hold our community accountable. And that's one of the things that our project, Advanced Geo, is, started, is, is hoping to do, is actually most of our trainings are geared towards faculty and towards department heads and chairs, because they're in leadership positions, and they have to hold themselves accountable, but they need to hold their peers accountable. So often in science, we're kind of trained to keep our blinders and just focus on our research and our science, and not really think about how the people around us are, are being treated or how they're treating other people. And we actually needed to make it our responsibility to hold ourselves and our community accountable. And I have a picture here a lot of people will recognize. Um, Bethann McLaughlin from Vanderbilt University, who's actually been holding leaders accountable. And in response to a lot of her activism um, and direct action, the National Institutes of Health in the United States and also the, um, the AAA as the American Association for the Advancement of Science is rethinking their policies about you know, how you know, should known harassers hold some of the top scientific awards in the nation or continue to receive funding. And for that work, she is actually losing her job. So we need to keep our community accountable. We also need to recognize and compensate labor. We need to recognize the work, and we need to hire people who are doing an increasing diversity in our field, because they're doing the labor, because they're expected to do the labor because of their identity, or also just for being in the room, right, and contributing their diverse perspective. So we need to actually recognize and compensate this labor, because very often we might actually hire, you know, one person of color in the department, and expect them to do all this diversity work, right? But we don't pay them more, right? And at the same time, we actually expect them to keep up with their scientific standards. And if they don't, because they're doing all this labor, and at the same time, they're doing all this invisible labor of all this mentoring of everybody else in the department, in the college, in the university who didn't have any other role model to talk to, right? And that's completely unrecognized labor. They might actually end up not hitting the expectations for scientific excellence and not keep their job. So we need to recognize and compensate that labor. And that gets me to my last point, which is we really need to redefine how we measure scientific success. Because the way we do it right now, it actually is at the expense of people's mental health, people's physical health, people's livelihoods, and people's lives. So we really need to think about what makes you a good science, scientist, right? And what makes good science? Because we know that the behaviors that we're currently um, you know, condoning and supporting actually keep people away from doing their best science. And with that, I'll leave you with thinking about how we should really be treating our people better than our data. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. We have uh, scheduled uh, some time, and not really long time, for discussion at the end of the session. But I would take this opportunity, given that we have some minutes, uh, to ask the audience if you have any question on this. And let me, first of all, make a comment on the last statement. I fully agree we need to, to change uh, our methods for scientific assessment. 
I fully agree on that because uh, I, I think this is a key. And uh, I wonder, I am convinced that scientific societies can take action in that respect. We had a great debate a couple of days ago, yesterday, it was yesterday morning on that, and there was a general agreement among the speakers and the audience. And uh, I think a relevant question is what should we do? Because, uh, as I said, I think we can take action, but the strategy is to be defined. But uh, I would leave uh, now the floor to the audience for questions on what has been presented. Yeah, please, if you can go to the mic, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I wonder, do you maybe know if there are any studies about sexual orientation and sexual identity in science? Is there any disc discrimination? Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, I don't know of any studies in the geosciences per se, um, but there's, there's definitely work on um, the broader sciences. There's actually, um, usually I show data, I, did, I didn't end up doing it, but the American Physical Society actually had a survey of their LGBT plus physicists um, and found that a large proportion of them reported feeling exclusionary behaviors. And then there is also different groups even within LGBT plus community being more marginalized. So women more than men, and then gender non-conforming having disproportionate impact, uh, and transgender physicist scientists are experiencing three times as much exclusionary behaviors as cisgender, so absolutely. There's also a queer and STEM survey that was done a couple of years ago that one of our collaborators was one of the, the lead PIs, and they published that as well. Yeah. Where can I find these studies? If you want to talk to me, I can give you those studies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There is another question, please. I'm Jan Boon and I'm retired. Uh, I have a question. This happens often in institutions. And um, what would be the role of management in here? And if you see that they have a particular role, uh, are they really uh, exercising that role? Universities or, or scientific institutions? Oh, well, both universities yeah. and uh, federal and provincial uh, research organizations. Yeah. So in the United States, um, academic institutions are, are failing at addressing the problems that we're talking about. Um, and so that's why I think professional societies have actually stepped up because they're filling in a role that academic societies are not doing. And then, for example, in the United States right now, um, under our current administration, the Department of Secretary, the Secretary of the Department of Education is actually proposing changes to some of the kind of legislation or, or, or national policies surrounding especially gender discrimination and harassment in academic institutions. And they actually want to absolve universities of being responsible for what happens off campus, which is terrible news for people who take students to the conferences in the field. According to this proposed policy, the university would not be responsible if something happens, even during educational field travel. Thank you. One more question, please. Hi, Eric. Hi, Erika. So, first of all, thank you for the great uh, talk and also the, all the information and statistics you showed. Um, my name is Julia Wagemann, and I'm just um, about, or we, we, I'm involved in setting up a uh, network on women in geospatial, um, and we're just about to start. And the problem I often encounter with, di with diversity and equality is that um, it's good for people who are already uh, interested in a topic, um, probably also people here, they are here because they're interested in a topic, but we need to we need to raise awareness to people who don't know anything about it or they, don't, they, they think actually everything is equal. So my one question is if you have strategies how to, how to engage more people. And uh, the other, uh, the other um, encounter I often face is that if I talk especially also to young women um, about the problems, they 
feel quite offended and uh, say, oh, we're not a woman group and I don't, I don't want to be on this extreme side to be part of a woman group um, because we women, we, we like to be in the middle, we don't want to be on extreme sides one, the, or one or the other. So, or if you have there also some strategies to, to be less offensive <laughs> but more, um, I don't know, in, inviting, yes. <laughs> So I think at this stage of my career, I think being offensive is good. <laughs> we need, some of us, I, I'm full professor now, I can afford to be offensive, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm in a position of privilege in that way um, and in other ways. But in terms of getting other people involved, that's why I think leadership is really important and that's why I think having society leadership be present here um, and actually having messages from the leadership that this is expected behavior and that this is really important. Even if there's not that many people in the room, you know what, it doesn't matter. Even if you're not in this room, AGUs and EGUs new code of conduct still applies to you. And if you violate that policy, right, you might not serve on leadership and you might lose award, your award, right? And funding agencies are doing the same, right? And, and so, so really at this point, right, so, so I kind of believe in in, in you know, grassroots efforts, right, and communicating and, and helping each other, and I'm a believer of, of networks of in supporting each other, and I would say um, those, those women might realize they will need it as they progress in their career, because it sometimes gets worse as you, yes. as you advance. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I think leadership is really important, and so we need to get leadership involved. That's why a lot of the trainings we're doing are tailored to academic heads and chairs, and we'll go into departments or through AGU's heads and chairs. They're there because they're expected to be there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, very stimulating. Uh, and now it's time to move forward with the next talk given by Dan Conley and the co-author Johanna Stadmark. Uh, the title is Gender Inequality, Persistence and Policies. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Conley. I'm a professor in biogeochemistry. Uh, my co-collaborator here, uh, Johannes Stadmark, is also a biogeochemist. And biogeochemistry is a great field because you can do biology, you can do geology, you can do chemistry, you can work in terrestrial systems, you can work in aquatic systems, you can work in marine systems, uh, and you can do lots of different things. But I'm not here to really talk about my uh, work that I'm doing for research. I'm here to talk about why I'm here and what am I trying to accomplish. Um, so which button do you push to move this? Click. Which one? Click, left click or right left click? click? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So um, why do I work on diversity? So I grew up in the United States. I had women around me throughout most of my life in different capacities. Um, my mom was a nurse, she worked. Um, I have two sisters who have professional uh, careers. Uh, in high school, I had two women mentors. I had uh, Mrs. Lowe, the one on the left, and she taught me calculus and two other kids in the back of a classroom while she was working teaching another uh, math course. And uh, Angie Matamoros on the right, uh, who ended up winning the Teacher of the Year some years later. And then I, uh, through my career, I ended up at a place at the University of Maryland called Horn Point Laboratory. And it was biological oceanography, but it was a laboratory where there were a lot of women. And I just got used to having women as part of my life and my scientific uh, area. Um, what happened in 1995 is I moved to Denmark and I became a coordinator of a project on the Gulf of Riga. And there were uh, proposals that went out and uh, I became a coordinator of one part of the projects. And it turned out there were other coordinators and they were all men. And the secretariat, of course, from the Environmental Protection Agency was a female. And it was a surprise to walk in this room um, but I really hadn't gotten used to uh, these kinds of situations before. And then about a year later, the Freshwater Biological Laboratory was celebrating its 100-year anniversary. And it was a, an amazing uh, 
celebration held at the Academy of Science. And it's in this classic room uh, built in 1910 or 1920, and there's all these pictures of men standing around. And, uh, and the room could hold 100 people. And there were 96 men in that room and four women. And, um, and then at my job at NERI, we were talking about hiring people. And uh, we were, many people in the department were very happy that we had gender uh, diversity in the department. But if you were, looked, 60% uh, of the men, most of them were scientists, and 40% were women, and they were either uh, technicians in the laboratory or administrative personnel. And so I stood up and started to ask questions during a retreat for the department. And that discussion took a life of its own. And it went on for an hour. And I had the head of the department come up to me that evening and bawl me out for you know, ruining the whole schedule. But it happened that we hired two women out of that. And I think it was a really good thing to do. And because of that, I've chosen to stand up and speak. And so when you see something you don't like, you should stand up and say something. If you see a situation that's going on, you should say something. So I think probably the one that I'm most proud of is one that we did in 2012 with Johanna and I, where we were looking at nature and looking at news and views. And we went through two years of nature to find out that women were very poorly represented in an invitation-only article. This wasn't something where people are applying and getting. It was the editors were calling people up and inviting them. And there were only 4% in the earth sciences with, and environmental sciences, which is crazy considering the number of people in the field. Um, this was actually rather difficult to publish. We had a three-month conversation in Nature, and first they wanted to know how we got the data, how we did the analysis. Um, and then they came back, and as nature often does, they rewrite things for you. And they wrote the paper, rewrote the paper completely. And um, we thought about it, and it was during the summer holidays, and we decided that we would stick to our guns, and we wanted the paper published as it was. We would, of course, take on some edits, but we weren't going to change it for nature. And it took them a month to decide, and they came back and they said, OK. And so it got published in August of 2012, and it was actually rather quiet after that. And um, then the amazing thing happened. In December of 2012, Nature did a review of itself, and they came up with the concept that they were sexist. Even though they had 60 to 70% of their editors were women, uh, there were all kinds of problems in the organization. And I think which is amazing about it is nature has changed. We've been keeping track of them, and they have gotten better in terms of the percentage of women in news and views. Um, I recently was asked to review a paper on nature, and it said if you can't review the paper, um, you're welcome to give some suggestions. But please remember, we look at the diversity of the people you're uh, recommending what country they're from and what discipline they're from. And that was amazing. I've never seen that uh, from a journal before, that asking for diversity in the reviewers that you're suggesting. So they have really improved, and I'm very uh, proud of that. Um, as we talked earlier, gender inequalities are numerous uh, in our science. And there's a number of things that are well known in job applications and pay inequalities, uh, promotion, uh, getting credit for work done. I think the good story is Jocelyn Bell, who decided, uh, discovered pulsars, actually has been uh, very much rewarded for her, her work um, long after she did not get the Nobel Prize. And there's also bias in scholarly publications. And, Many of these examples were taken up yesterday in that excellent selection uh, session on diversity and equality. But what about research grants? That's an area 
that we decided to try and look on. And, and it comes from a couple different reasons. And one, uh, there was this Swedish um, problem in 1997, and it was in the medical board, and it really rocked the country, and it also had international implications as well. And the board was giving out um, positions for assistant professor positions. So they were basically tenure track positions. And everyone on the board was giving <coughs> positions to other people on the board. And it turns out they were all men. And uh, this word got out about it. And um, the newspaper and other investigative reporters had to sue to get the data. But in Sweden, everything is open and then they uncovered the biases that occurred in that meeting. And it turned out that they basically let go all the men and they weren't able to serve on boards anymore. And I think that really shook the world in terms of uh, different organizations in terms of grants and how they give out money. Um, so we decided to use the ERC as an example. So together, in collaboration with uh, Claudia, we started to test for bias at the European Research Council. And the European Research Council gives out a lot of money. It's, it was over 20 billion euros from the time period 2007 to 2018. And it's also known as being highly competitive. And there's three different areas where they give out money to, to starting grants, people two to seven years after their PhD, or consolidated grants seven or 12 years after, and then advanced grants. And what's interesting about this is you can get time added on if you've been in military service, or you've taken care of a sick family member, or if you've had children. And so it's trying to even the playing field for everybody. But we were interested, are there, sex, uh, are there success rates between genders uh, of people applying? Um, are there national differences? And so we decided to compare uh, France with uh, three of the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And we were also wondering, are there differences in societal benefits? And uh, to try and analyze those to see if that would account for any of the differences. And what we found um, was is that the number of women are actually rather low that are applying. For the advanced grants, which are, uh, they tend to be older white men, it has increased, but it's only 10% of women that are applying. Um, the triangles are um, for starting grants, but after 2012, they broke the starting grants into two different pools, the consolidators and the starters. And both of them show some small increases uh, through time in terms of number of female, number of submissions by women. But then we started to look at success rates. And the good news is that the overall success rate of men and women are equivalent in the ERC at the scale of the entire ERC. And I'm working now with only the PE panels, the physical sciences and uh, engineering panels, and, uh, and you can see in the figure that uh, from the first two bars that the number of success rates of both men and women are approximately equal. But it varies a lot, and it varies by country, and it varies by gender. For example, um, for some particular uh, reason, France has a much higher success rate than places in other, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, or Finland. And at least we're initially attributing that because in, Sweet in, in France they have two systems. You have the university system and people are teaching mostly. And then you have the uh, research laboratories, the CNRS, where the people have no teaching duties and they're primarily involved in research. So it might be a selection already at that point in time, where it's the more the, um, the better trained people or the more people, the people that have more uh, access to resources uh, and publications that are doing those kinds of grants. 
Um, the differences between Denmark and Sweden and Finland are all about the same. Finland is a little bit less, especially for the men. And the women aren't as successful as the men in these particular countries. And again, women only comprise 17% of the submissions. So we were trying to look at different reasons for this. And one of them that we thought a lot about and what's thought about a lot at the commission is the ERC different from other competitive funding schemes? Um, and why are people applying? And the one reason why many countries apply is the national funding is so low that it's not enough to fund all the research. So they need to look outside uh, their countries, either through EU funding or through Marie Curie training networks or through uh, the ERC, for example. Uh, people also appreciate the international recognition when you get, when you get one of these elite uh, ERC grants. And then it's also the freedom and flexibility to do blue sky research, um, which is very interesting. Um, but what are the causes between the countries? Um, we were trying to also attribute it to different uh, national structures, especially in terms of things like healthcare and national funding, uh, maternity leave, parental leave, daycare, um, job flexibility. And it turns out that all the European countries, there are certainly differences between the type of benefits and how much you get and how many months you have, but all of them have some form of health care, all of them have some form of daycare, all of them have some form of, uh, of, of uh, maternity leave, and some have parental leave. So um, that is still work to be done further to try and uh, see if we can analyze these differences. So we decided to look at success rates globally and at other institutions around the world to see do they have equivalent success rates between men and women. And we went to the United States, and there was this GAO report in 2015. And they analyzed six different funding agencies. And, um, and they uh, had three of them, the National Institutes of Health, uh, National Science Foundation, and the USDA that funds agricultural research. And those are three of the bigger uh, research organizations in the United States. And all of them had no evidence that there were any differences between the sex, success rates. Um, there were three organizations that they said there could be, but there really wasn't uh, sufficient data to make any, um, uh, to be able to analyze for su success rates. And this is really extremely important to be able to collect data and report data and then to analyze that data to see if you have success rates. There are places like the Marie Curie uh, actions, and they are very proud that they uh, have over 40% of the funding going to women, but they don't tell what the initial numbers were, and we're, we're uh, in the process of trying to get those numbers for the future. But if you look at all the big uh, funding agencies, uh, places like the NERC and the Royal Society and in Canada, um, uh, the Swedish Science Foundation, there's really no evidence for disparities in success rates across a broad range of funding organizations. Um, one of the problems is, is we only have a handful of languages among us. So if you come from other countries that have languages that we're probably not going to speak, anything from uh, Romanian to uh, Portuguese, please come talk to us and tell us what you know about countries, uh, about your country in terms of their success rates. Um, unfortunately, in the country that I lived in for a number of years before I moved in Sweden, there seems to be a problem with success rates. Um, this report was uh, released in 2017 and it was looking at 2016 data. And where the circle is, is 
really the Natural Science Foundation, FNU, it's called. You see nature and universe. And, uh, and in there, there's a huge disparity between success rates where uh, men have a success rate of 11% and women have a success rate of 6%. And I actually find that quite shocking. And if you look across the whole spectrum, uh, there are, are smaller differences, but most of them have differences between the success rates between the two. There's one field there that has only women in it, over to the right, but there were only three applications that were funded. So it's much more difficult to decide uh, if that's a real number, and it was for one year. Um, unfortunately, there's uh, something else has happened here. Um, they have these very prestigious things called villain investigators, and they give about five million euros per award, and they gave 11 scientists those awards. Um, does anyone want to yell out how many men got the award? 11 men were awarded this. And so we're in the process, this happened last week, and so we're in the process of trying to uh, do something about this. Anyway, um, there was this study in Canada that came out this year, and it was in Lancet, and it was for the uh, medical uh, uh, profession. And the medical profession has problems also in the ERC. There's very few women in those categories, and it, it partly has been attributed to uh, it's the group leader who turns in the application, and he is often a, a male. And you can see that the success rates are very different between men and female across these three different programs in the Canadian Institutes of Health. But they decided to try a different program as a test case, and they did an experiment where the, it wasn't, the review wasn't focused on, on uh, the caliber of the principal investigator, but it was primarily focused on the project itself. Um, they also talked about the principal investigator because you can't do uh, judge science by only looking at the proposal itself, but to evaluate the uh, investigator too if they're capable of doing this. And when they did that, the success rates changed and they had equivalent success rates between men and women by carrying this out. So they're now expanding this program across uh, all the granting schemes in this uh, particular uh, area in, in Canada. And I think it's something that we should look at in other places too. This has happened in Sweden where we have been focusing on the grant proposal and not as much on the CV. It used to be it was given to you depending upon your CV. And now it's as, uh, the grant is important. So the last thing I want to talk about, I'm going to go back to the European Research Council. And it's something that I find very disturbing. And only 17% of women are applying for these grants. And you think, oh, is it just the ERC? But if you start to look at other science foundations, you'll see numbers of 20, 25% of people applying for grants are women. And I don't know why women aren't applying for these grants. I've heard various things like women just don't want to compete or women like to, would prefer to work in, in teams. Um, I think that we need to know much more about this because uh, I, I, th I think it is also, if you're not gonna apply for money, you're not gonna get the money. I also firmly believe in competitive research funding. I think when you write a research grant, you learn a lot from writing that particular grant, and you get, you get to be a better scientist by having to write grants. Okay, so what can we do? I think we recommend that all funding agencies um, implement unconscious bias training, so when you're, uh, reviewing grants, you have some concept of the fact that everyone is biased and 
and you can try and overcome that bias. Um, the other thing is about the CD, CV, and I, this is controversial. Uh, there are some people that have recommended we should do it blindly, where we shouldn't look at the CV. And uh, so I think the question that I want to ask you, is it a good solution to focus only on the science and not on the CV? Um, the question is, is there bias in funding? I think that all organizations should be required to post the statistics regarding success on, a, on an annual basis when they fill their, their annual reports so that we can, everyone can see clearly and it could be transparent what the success rates are. And finally, to change the underrepresentation of women, we recommend that there, a study be taken on why this happens and uh, also that more women should be encouraged to apply. So thank you. We have some time for questions. Yeah. Please, uh, Robin, the first question, and then, and then you. Yeah. Ha, uh, ah, I got the microphone first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the focus on the money. It's a wonderful thing to uh, you've done. And one of the issues I found when I was doing the advanced work at Columbia was the tremendous resident, residence, res, reticence for anybody to say anything about the private money. And because I was seeing tremendous bias in where the private money was going, where the private postdocs were being funded. And I was pretty much slapped on the hand for saying anything about that because the institution was afraid of losing the money. So how do we approach the question of foundations and private money, which, as you showed, are going to have an increasing influence on who succeeds in our field? I think that's a very good question, and I have no answer for it. But we have the same problem in, in Sweden of the private funders. It's a black hole. I mean, they, it's their money. They can do what they want. And um, one of the funders is funding about half of all Swedish research right now that's funded by the state. And so in many countries, this is a problem because they're not posting the statistics. And for the Willem Foundation, I don't know how many women applied. I've heard rumors about it, but I don't know if that information is really, um, has been published. But certainly that they said there were 80 applications and there were 11 men that were funded. And I, I think there's a problem there. There are two more questions. Uh, if you don't mind, Brooks, uh, I would give the first, the front mic first, please. Okay. Great talk, Daniel. I, I think the most important thing moving forward there is the slide that you showed with that super bold red arrow, arrow on it. Why aren't women applying? And I appreciate the possibility that they like to work more in, in uh, communities and teams or they're less competitive than men. But I think one of the things that's missing in that list, at least from my perspective, is that I think for a long time women don't think they'll have a fair chance on the panel. I mean, it's a lot of work, and at the end of the day, no matter how good or it might be, that there's that factor of it won't really be fair. You don't have quite equal chance. So I think gathering that kind of information on why women aren't applying is really essential and working, working with that to encourage more applicants. Yes, will you write a grant proposal to help us do the work? <laughs> We have one more question. So, uh, Brooks Hansen, HU. First, uh, I, I think your uh, nature paper date made a big difference there, so congratulations on that. On the grant study, two things. Um, as we presented yesterday, we have found that um, women auth first authored papers are accepted at a higher rate in AGU journals than men. We don't think that that's reverse bias, which was suggested to us. We actually think that it's probably because the quality of the papers is better and there's this self-selection that's going on before submission. So um, the question for you in looking at the grants, um, since the number of women that are submitting grants is fairly low, do you think there's a self-selection going on and actually the funding rate should be higher than it is? Um, 
rather than equal. And have you, to test that, have you either looked at the distribution of scores for the grants and are they equally distributed between men and women? And secondly, have you looked, I, th I seem to recall one other study, um, vaguely, and so you can correct me, that looked at um, that the funding rate was the same, but actually the monetary awards were biased heavily, and have you looked at that? Thanks. Yeah, yeah the, the difference in the amount of money they get is actually well known and has been documented, and that information is usually easy to take from public documents. Um, looking at what grades they receive in different science foundations, I, no, I, I've worked with different science foundations and I, I can't see that ever happening. That is very uh, highly classified material. I mean, because it's based on people's opinions and rankings and usually you're told you got the money. You're never told you were number one or uh, you were just above the line. It's not something that is public knowledge and I think that, um, I don't know if that would really help and it could be more damaging than anything else. So. Thank you, Daniel, very inspiring. We need to move forward with the next talk given by Gilles Karsten, and the title is AGO's New Diversity and Inclusion Strategic Plan, a bold vision for strengthening geosciences. Please. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to the conveners for inviting me. Thanks to AGU for paying for me to come to this um, and present on their behalf. And thank you to all, you all for attending. Um, I uh, have just my name listed here, but I'm actually presenting the efforts of multiple people who were involved in a task force that I chaired uh, for a little over a year and a half. So just briefly, um, why am I interested in diversity? I've uh, been involved pretty much in some aspect of diversity um, ever since I was a graduate student, uh, first as a recipient of a fellowship that the National Science Foundation offered to encourage women to go into the geosciences. Um, I consider myself the second cohort, really, of seagoing ocean uh, scientists. Very few women were involved in the field at that time. Um, it was wonderful to get paid to do that kind of work, I must say. Um, as an associate researcher at the University of Hawaii studying mid-ocean ridge processes for a long time, I was involved in uh, both supervising female graduate students and also uh, uh, developing programs to mentor some of the, some of the graduate students um, about some of the issues that we continue to talk about today. Um, and the comment before about why some of the younger women are less interested in um, participating in some of these things. At the time when we tried to start some of these activities, uh, we were told, oh, well, that's your generation's issue. Uh, that's not our generation's issue. And I would argue that many of the people who are now talking about these topics are the ones who should have listened to us a long time ago. <laughs> um, but then I got out of active research and I went to work uh, first at the American Geophysical Union as their education manager for a few years, uh, where I actually was involved in developing the previous version of AGU's diversity plan, uh, which was issued in 2002. Um, I moved on to the National Science Foundation, where as a program officer in the Office of, uh, Director for Geosciences, I oversaw uh, grant programs investing in research on how to broaden participation, what strategies are most effective, how can we uh, recruit and retain a variety of, of talent in, in the geosciences workforce. I am now retired, however. Uh, I'm here representing the American Geophysical Union. I think most of you are familiar with AGU as an organization. Um, it has uh, many similar uh, types of activities to EGU. Um, and in fact, many of you may be members of both organizations. We are a very large scientific society, uh, over 60,000 members. Um, we have published peer-reviewed journals. We convene large meetings. We have honors and awards, we do outreach, we uh, are engaged in uh, public information and public uh, policy discussions. And so very parallel to what EGU offers uh, its members as well. AGU as an organization has uh, a pretty diverse membership. Increasingly, uh, women are, uh, 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 as you can see with this figure on the left, a growing part of the population of the membership. Uh, now about 30%. Back when I was a student, it was around 10%. So a very different dynamic when you came to a, a meeting, I must say. 
Um, in addition, AGU is increasingly international in its membership. The top figure is 1995. The bottom figure is 2018 data, showing a regional uh, representation of the membership. And, and you can see that the, uh, even though we're called the American Geophysical Union, uh, now about 40% of our membership comes from outside of the United States. There's another kind of diversity AG has, which is in its disciplinary focus. Uh, it has evolved over time from some of the sort of traditional geosciences of volcanism, tectonics, ocean science, et cetera. Uh, you can see here in the growth in the membership of specific sections within AGU uh, that, that some have sort of waxed and waned. Some have uh, new sections have been added over time to, to reflect the evolving nature of our communities and our, our disciplinary focus. Uh, the two newest uh, sections are on geohealth and education, um, reflecting them as an emerging priority for the community. But despite those kinds of diversities, there's still a lot of diversity that is not uh, captured by both the AGU membership or the Earth and Space Sciences workforce in general. Um, here's just a, a couple of figures from a paper I just published in the Journal of Geoscience Education uh, showing the bachelor's degrees on the left and the master's degrees on the right of Hispanics and uh, African Americans in the United States. This is data from the National Science Foundation. And it's provided uh, in context of looking at the physics, chemistry, and biology communities so that you can see how we are doing as a field relative to the other uh, course, core sciences. Uh, the, U, the, I don't know if you can see it, the geosciences data is uh, the red figures at the bottom. The uh, biological is the blue. The physics is green and the chemistry is purple, which may be hard to see from the back. Uh, in general, there has been an increase in participation of Hispanics at both degree levels over time in terms of degrees earned. Um, geosciences is low compared to the other fields, but it certainly is not as bad as, um, it's, it's pretty much on a par with physics and we're showing improvements at the same rate or better in some of these communities. Um, so we're making progress, not as much as we would like, but there's certainly progress being made. For African Americans in the United States, uh, we continue in all four fields to do a terrible job of attracting those communities to the uh, STEM disciplines um, with very little change over time, quite frankly. So these kinds of um, data, the changing nature of who AGU is, the changing uh, needs of the workforce, uh, the, the failure to attract and retain certain communities, has been part of the motivation uh, for AGU in the last couple of years to undertake uh, more serious conversations about broadening participation. And this is being done in conjunction with two other initiatives that AGU started uh, really about 2016, I would guess. Um, and, and these relate to uh, what Erica described earlier, the uh, looking at ethics and scientific integrity. There was also a task force on the talent pool and, and workforce needs of our communities. And then I chaired the diversity and inclusion task force, um, and I'll be talking primarily about those results here. This uh, AGU's efforts have happened within the context of a larger kind of conversation about um, that's been uh, promoted by several high-level reports in the last uh, couple of years about integrity within the scientific enterprise, about graduate STEM education, how it needs to evolve or adapt to pr produce the workforce that we need for the future, and then issues of harassment, uh, particularly for women, um, and the sort of the culture of science and the climate of science. Um, I would argue uh, that these three efforts in tandem uh, really form the heart of what constitutes scientific excellence within our, within our community. And, and so it's been wonderful to have our diversity uh, and inclusion activities be able to reinforce what's come out of those other two initiatives along the way. Um, as I said, I was asked uh, to come out of retirement briefly to uh, chair a task force. We had 17 members, uh, including international participation. Uh, we met a little over a year to, uh, and through a variety of meetings, mostly virtual, but some face-to-face. -face. We uh, tried to put our work within the context of what was happening in other organizations, both um, in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., both funding agencies, other scientific societies that were relevant. We talked to uh, Claudia, we talked to um, others to, to get, try to get a better handle on what EGU was doing. Um, 
we looked internally at, uh, across the organization, one of the mandates of this task force was to consider all aspects of AGU's activities as an enterprise. It was not just looking at developing the workforce, it was not just looking at meetings, it was looking at publications, it was looking at the staff, at the governance, the award structures, the in, entire operation, that, uh, set of operations that AGU uh, implements. So in, in that regard, it was a, it's a great opportunity to try to get all of the different activities that AGU undertakes aligned with regard to its diversity and inclusion um, messaging. We obviously consulted with the AGU Council and Board during the con uh, development of our plan and, and invited uh, AGU member feedback during a comment period once we had a draft plan. I'm uh, very happy to say that at the December Board and Council meetings, uh, the draft plan that I'll be describing next was unanimously adopted, um, and uh, we're really looking forward to seeing it fully implemented going forward. One of the first challenges that the task force had was to really kind of define what do we mean by diversity and inclusion. As a large international, disciplinarily, culturally diverse uh, set of members, we really had to think carefully about this. Um, and, and we decided not to list the kinds of attributes that we were thinking. We, we started there. I think many people think, well, it's women, it's you know, minorities, it's uh, LGBTQ+, plus, it's uh, then you start getting to, well, veteran status, country of origin, economic class, you know. So we were worried about uh, listing, trying to create a list and thereby potentially not including some, some group that we, we might offend and we didn't want to do that. So the diversity, we, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the uh, definition we came up with is that diversity is the full spectrum of personal attributes, cultural affiliations, and professional or socioeconomic statuses they characterize individuals within society. Collectively, these identities inform and shape one's scientific way of thinking. We further went on to uh, define <clears throat> why AG valued diversity, and it's because it catalyzes productivity in the earth and space science enterprise, fosters the professional success of AGU's members, increases the vitality of the organization, and enhances the societal relevance and impact of AGU science. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as far as inclusion is concerned, a little bit longer definition. Um, I don't think I'm going to read this to you, but, but we do have that in the plan, which is available on the AG website. What I think was important, though, was to, to, to say why we wanted to um, care about inclusion. And it's that AGU strives to cultivate a culture of respect and be a model organization and scientific community for inclusive practices. We strive for this objective because it augments the quality and impacts of the earth and space science enterprise and its workforce. It directly supports the personal fulfillment, career success, and impact of AGU members by facilitation of their contributions, and it is the morally and ethically responsible thing to do. <clears throat> now, in thinking about this plan, we felt that there were some underlying imperatives that had to be, uh, be stated, frankly. One of them is that scientific excellence and integrity in the earth and space sciences is paramount. Anything that comes and arises through implementation of this plan should do nothing to undermine the quality and, and integrity of the scientific process and, and activities that AGU as a scientific society supports. Also, as a scientific society, it makes sense that we be informed by evidence. Uh, I think Erica talked before about this, that, that we need to look at the data both internally and externally to make decisions and, and, and make choices and, and to implement programs and test them and evaluate them to make sure that they're being effective and, and achieving the goals that we're setting out to, to pursue. We want to basically make sure that the contributions to science by any individual, regardless of their personal identity, are, is respected and valued equally. The focus should be on things that AGU can directly address or influence. Many of the barriers to participation that, uh, are structural. They relate to access and opportunity or discrimination uh, in, for, in the educational systems. Those are outside of AGU's control, so it makes no sense for us to try to, make our, uh, to beat our heads against the wall on things that we cannot do, but we can work in partnership to try to help inform improvements in those areas. 
And finally, the intent is not to promote specific groups of individuals over others, but to create an environment within AGU and the Earth and Space Sciences overall where all individuals feel they can bring their whole selves to the enterprise of science. The, uh, so what I'd like to do now is just briefly run through some of the goals and objectives of the new AGU Diversity and Inclusion Strategic Plan. The vision of this plan is that diversity and inclusion are recognized and celebrated as being essential for the success of AGU, its members, and the global Earth and Space Science enterprise. We identified five goals, um, and each goal has three uh, objectives. These are fairly broad objectives, um, as you'll see. And they really fall into three categories. One has to do with resources and information uh, related to that goal. The second objective has to do with incentives or opportunities. And the third and most important, perhaps, has to do with accountability. The first goal, and I think probably the most important one in terms of achieving the vision of the new plan, is that we want to change the culture of the Earth and Space Sciences community and the AGU community. And the goal states that diversity and inclusion are widely recognized within the AGU community as essential features of excellence in the earth and space sciences. And this goal arises from the fact that there has now been a large body of research developed, scientific research, primarily social science research, to, to demonstrate that diverse communities actually perform better, they are stronger organizations, and therefore this is in our community's best interest to promote and advance diversity because it makes us better scientists, it makes us more effective as an organization, and, and therefore this is a, a goal unto itself, is to, to, um, to promote diverse, uh, a diverse enterprise. And the objectives that fall within this, uh, basically, again, information, increase the awareness in the community about why diversity and inclusion is essential for scientific excellence and organizational success. The, in the incentive piece, promote and expand community-based earth and space science research collaborations. One of the programs that AGU uh, manages is a thriving earth exchange. This basically helps communities develop scientific uh, research activities in collaboration with scientists that really is community-focused. And many of these uh, community-focused uh, research efforts within thriving earth exchange are uh, re related to social justice issues, environmental consequences of, of and due to damage, et cetera. And so um, it's a natural environment in which to try to build those partnerships and collaborations with underserved communities that are not currently fully engaged in the geosciences. And then finally, the accountability piece, um, to codify with uh, diversity and inclusion uh, within the sci Earth and Space Science Scientific Code of Contact, and then enforce this new ethics policy that um, we have implemented. The second main goal has to do with improving the climate of the Earth and Space Sciences and in AGU activities in particular. And this goal says that AGU provides a safe, welcoming environment and cultivates an inclusive culture that supports the success of every individual AGU member and their science. The objectives under this goal are to expand the supportive activities that AGU offers, addressing the needs of specific affinity groups at all career levels. We do a lot for early career uh, researchers already at AGU. We offer a career service. Uh, we have mentoring programs, et cetera. But this would also include expansion to help support those like me, retired uh, geoscientists who still are engaged in AGU, or people at, at any stage of their career or people who may want to have um, a support group related to um, some uh, sub-affinity that, uh, you know, veterans in the geosciences, for example. I mean, there are a lot of different uh, types of communities that may want to have more specialized programming to help them uh, be more successful, to feel more welcome within the AGU community. Uh, the second objective, provide an environment where everyone is engaged in, empowered for, and informed about diversity and inclusion issues. Here is creating opportunities for people to get engaged within the membership so that they can help to change that climate, um, coming to talks like this, for example. 
And then the third, the accountability piece, is to do with regularly assessing the climate and attitudes of AGU members regarding diversity and inclusion. AGU runs a, an annual member survey. We can easily add in questions that relate to how we're doing as an organization in, in advancing this goal. And I was thinking that, Erica, some of the surveys that the Geo Advance program is developing could be part of that um, effort. The third goal has to do with empowering the membership. One of AGU's biggest strengths is its 60,000 plus members, and each one of them could be an agent of change for diversity and inclusion within their own institutions. And that's basically um, what the, this goal says, is that the members are empowered to be infect, effective, that they have been given the tools and the resources, uh, the information that arms them, with, uh, so that they can be more impactful, more effective, that they understand the research, that they know what are the best practices. There's been a lot of investment uh, done on how to broaden participation to improve retention, uh, to support uh, young faculty with m mentoring programs, et cetera. It's a matter of making the rest of the membership better informed, not just the people who are here in the room, but everyone else within the membership informed about how to do that. Uh, the second objective, increase and expand the, the rewards offered for diversity and inclusion activities. Uh, try to uh, basically show value for the, the fact that our members are engaging in these kinds of activities. And then, more importantly, perhaps, the accountability piece is that consider and reward diversity and inclusion preferentially when selecting AGU honorees and, and honor, uh, leadership. Um, so it's in addition to, just as NSF, the National Science Foundation, evaluates your scientific intellectual merit in a proposal, it looks at the broader impacts piece as well. And this could be a way of uh, weaving diversity and inclusion into other selection processes that AGU does. The fourth goal is that AGU wants to be a leader for diversity and inclusion. Um, and I've, I've, I've welcomed some of the comments that have been made earlier today that AGU has started to take on that leadership role um, in, in setting uh, some of these programs in, in, um, in motion with the ethics in scientific integrity, for example. Um, and basically, that we want to be uh, leaders for the community. We want to work in partnership with the community. Um, and. We want to, as objectives under this, increase awareness about earth and space science opportunities within diverse communities. This is part of the recruitment uh, goal of the talent pool task force. We want to encourage systemic improvements in earth and space science systems that support diversity and inclusion. Um, AGU is undertaking uh, activities that are modeled after the Athena Swan program, for example. Um, a program called Sea Change, which is in collaboration with AAAS and some of the other uh, scientific organizations in the U.S., to try to essentially help uh, promote institutional change at the department level, so that uh, some of the barriers to uh, participation that may be more systemic within the educational system can be um, overcome through educating members through the Heads and Chairs for, Forum, things like that, to, and, and, and setting some standards for what constitutes good departmental behavior in the earth and space sciences to encourage uh, diverse participation. And you know, finally, establish some of these community-wide standards um, for best practices in both research and education within the geosciences. The final goal is to be a model organization. Um, I think there's no question that AGU, uh, because it's one of their four strategic priorities, is organizational excellence, and they, do, they want to sh extend that to everything they do related to diversity and inclusion as well. And the objectives under this goal basically is to increase the use of data to inform their diversity and inclusion decision making, report on progress uh, annually to the council and the membership, so this transparency piece that's so important. They want to increase representation of underrepresented groups on all AGU committees, uh, editorships, um, leadership, et cetera. And they want to have written uh, and established diversity and inclusion policies um, for all aspects of the operation, including the staff. Um, and more importantly, is enforce those policies. And so there is accountability across all aspects of the organization. 
Now, there are a lot of, uh, the, the actual diversity plan has about five or six pages of specific tactics for implementing these various goals and objectives. The objectives are pretty high level um, at this point. Um, and we, uh, one of the biggest recommendations that we made out of the task force was to convene a, standing, a permanent standing uh, committee on diversity and inclusion that reports to council. Um, and this uh, new, newly formed committee, which is just about, I think it's just being uh, announced this month, uh, Dr. Lisa White at the U University of California, Berkeley, is the chair of that new committee. It, um, they are uh, responsible for fleshing out in more details and more quantitatively, I would say, some of the uh, sub-objectives within the plan that the task force developed. Um, there, many of the tactics that are described in the diversity plan are along the lines of what Alberto was talking about before, you know, safe AGU for uh, meetings, uh, implicit bias training for leadership and committee chairs, um, you know, those kinds of um, specific activities that one can undertake to achieve these broad objectives that I've identified. This uh, committee also will be expected to work across the committees, um, like the EGU Diversity and Equity Committee, um, to try to better align all of the things that are happening within specific units of AGU's operation. They're gonna help establish metrics, which is gonna be very important for that account accountability piece. Uh, they will help to provide oversight on the annual climate workforce, uh, sorry, work climate survey. Um, and they will basically be the, the main ambassadors to develop partnerships with relevant organizations for broadening what AG is able to accomplish unto itself. Um, and finally, I just uh, wanted to comment again on this accountability piece because I do believe that it, uh, despite our best intentions, which is uh, what the plan ultimately is trying to achieve, none of it is gonna make any progress without the accountability. And I think that the ethics policy that was revised in 2017, which now explicitly says that discrimination, harassment, including sexual harassment, or bullying in any scientific or learning environment <clears throat> is unacceptable and constitutes scientific misconduct under the AGU scientific integrity and professional ethics policy. And with that kind of statement, AGU is holding everyone, members in this room, outside the room, as Erica said, uh, to a higher standard of what their behavior needs to be. And we have heard that there are already consequences for some AGU members who have had honors revoked. The, um, at least in the US, funding agencies are starting to make institutions accountable if uh, the PI is under any kind of investigation for harassment. Um, I, I believe the National Academies of Science is about to undertake a review as to whether they may revoke fellowship in the National Academies for these kinds of behaviors. So there is increasing community-wide interest in, in holding people accountable for this uh, misconduct, which should surely provide some incentive for people to want to become better informed about how to do things um, more appropriately going forward. Uh, and this is the address for the new Ethics and Equity Center. So just a final comment. Um, I've talked about what AGU is doing, but the question is what can EGU and you in the audience do to help us with the implementation going forward? Um, I mentioned we're a large international membership. I would say that we still um, need to learn more about what the needs might be with regard to diversity and inclusion from the international perspective. So this is a great opportunity to invite you to help us to, to shape our understanding uh, of where the needs may be um, in, those, uh, in that dimension. Um, we also hope that you'll help us to um, collaborate on initiatives to define and implement best practices for diversity and inclusion within the global community. We encourage your institutions to become partners with the new AGU Ethics and Equity Center, um, and you as individuals hopefully um, will find an opportunity to use those resources as, as they become populated. Um, I would also encourage those of you who are AGU members also to um, volunteer to serve on AGU committees. We, we're always looking for international participation um, and ha have that voice be part of our 
editor editorial group, our fall meeting group, um, our governance committees, et cetera. And then um, we've heard a lot about the failure of women to nominate, um, and I would say the same is true for international uh, participants, is nominating um, qualified members of your communities to, to, for AGU honors, for leadership positions, uh, and don't be afraid to nominate yourself, frankly, uh, because sometimes you can write the most glowing view of your personal you know, contributions to science than anybody could, right? Anyway, thank you very much for your time. questions on this last talk, but also for questions, uh, general questions on, uh, on the topic. In, so, the floor is yours. Questions on this last talk, or thank you. My name is Jan Boon, and I'm retired, and I had a question, the, the question of changing the culture is challenging because culture is a little vague and so on. Have you ever considered of ganging up with a bunch of sociologists that could uh, advise you on that? I, guess. Have, I mean, have you considered to, 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 to seek um, advice from a sociologists? There must be, they must have some techniques that we don't know of. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, while I was at uh, NSF, I was actually involved in a number of cross-disciplinary uh, programs that uh, related to climate change education that involved um, social scientists as part of the, the program. But one of the other programs that NSF was just starting as I le left was um, a program called Geo Opportunities for Leadership and Diversity. And one of the, um, the, the whole premise of that program was to try to bring people together, people, social scientists who worked on the research on leadership development and geoscientists to try to figure out how can you create effective programs to build the next generation of leaders, which you, we need, I think, both the, the grassroots effort coming from below as each of you go back into your own institution, but having the leadership also come at it and set the tone and the expectation, I think, is really important. And that was really one of the goals, is how can we create more leaders for diversity within our community? So there, there, you're, you're, you're right that we, we don't have all the skill sets needed to tackle this. Any more question? Yeah, please. Hi, thank you for your talk and all of the speakers. They've been really interesting. Um, I'm part of a committee for a a reasonably small a learned society within the UK and with an early career representative. We have about a thousand members. Um, and our younger members, we have pretty even gender distribution, but as we go up through the ages, things get a bit less balanced. Um, so we can see things are getting better with like our members coming through. But actually, we want to improve the diversity in our meetings and events that we hold, encourage more people to come that we know have stopped coming because there's um, most of the speakers or invited speakers are old white men, essentially. <laughs> um, and but we've got stuck in our committees basically having the argument whether this is a problem that we need to solve. Um, and maybe our committee is fairly biased towards the old white men uh, spectrum. <laughs> um, so I wondered if anyone had any uh, suggestions of how to deal with kind of getting past this argument of how this isn't our problem, what can we do to help? <laughs> I, have, I have many thoughts, but it, let me just tell an anecdote, because when I was at the University of Hawaii, we started a group called uh, Women in, uh, the, 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 I was in the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, or SOEST, and we, we started a program called WISER, Women in SOEST Earth Education and Research. And it, we tried to uh, share stories from the trenches, basically, with younger students and early career faculty who um, 
felt that because they looked around and they were, saw a lot of women in grad school, they thought there were no issues left. It was not their generation's problem, right? And uh, the reality is that you know the the part of what you're seeing at the senior levels is um, attrition for sure. Some of it is a lag because there weren't as many women getting degrees at that time, but it's also a reluctance on the younger generation. I mean, it's not just perhaps an old white male, uh, this is not our problem to solve, but the, in some cases, the people you're trying to help don't see it as a problem either because they're seeing it horizontally across their generation and they don't realize that some of the issues that affected the older generation are still in play. And I think, um, I don't know have a good suggestion for how to make people see it's their problem, but I do think that people respond a lot to peer pressure. And if you can find just one advocate, we had a very um, uh, outstanding, renowned meteor uh, me meteoriticist, I guess, um, who was involved early on, a white male, um, who was involved in Wiser early on. And he helped to set the tone that you know this is not just the women's problem or the young women's problem. This really is the faculty and the department's problem. And those, finding those voices and encouraging their participation, even if it's not all of them, can help to persuade people to take it more seriously, I would hope. Great. Thank you. I would like to invite here on the stage uh, the previous speakers, uh, Erika and uh, Daniel, so we can just uh, stimulate uh, in these five minutes left uh, an overall discussion on, on what was presented today. I think uh, it has been a set of inspiring talks uh, with, uh, that were, were uh, complementary in, in some ways. Uh, and uh, so I'm curious to know whether there are questions uh, in general on the, on the perspective, on the overall perspective that we presented so far. I'd like to actually, if I can, add something to that. Because I've noticed you mentioned peer pressure. And peer pressure actually from other professional societies and actually saying, hey, and I've, I've used this effectively, and I've actually been ca called out by other societies, like, you're making us look bad because your society is doing this. It's like, that's the point, right? Um, so actually, there is research on how other societies um, and associations have actually recognized that particular thing that you mentioned, right, underrepresentation of diversity in speakers as a problem and action they're taking to do. Um, again, you know, to fix that problem. And so bringing that to your leadership and saying, hey, these other societies that are bigger, more well-known with more resources are tackling this as a problem. We don't want to be left behind. That actually can be very effective with societies. Yeah, I, please. I just have something very quick to add as well. I agree that some people respond to peer pressure, but a lot of scientists respond to data. And I think increasingly over the past five or 10 years, there's a lot of data that shows an improvement in science and the excellence of science when you have a diverse group. So I would say that they may not respond you know, to you, the younger members of the committee, but I think the, the extent to which you can provide them some of that data would be very um, helpful. Please. Yeah, hello, thank you. Thank you everybody for your very nice talks. I think there is maybe one way to get more diversity, for example, in a panel. I think it's also important when someone is invited to be a panelist to check who else is on the panel and maybe even refuse to be on that panel if there is not enough diversity. That seems quite um, efficient to me. And especially people that are invited or usually people that have like responsibility and power. So my only comment to that is uh, sometimes on panels, the hardest people on women can be other women. I mean, there's this thing when you fought so hard to get there that some people feel that everyone has to suffer the same thing that you did to get there. It, it makes me think of the broader issue, and I think Erica mentioned this uh, a little bit too, is a lot of it has to do with um, the reward system and the reward structure. And as long as we value um, how many grants you got, how many publications you had, 
and at the expense of you know how many of your students got really good jobs or went on to alternative career paths or uh, came from diverse communities, you know people are going to choose to optimize the rewards that they know the system provides. And that's why it's kind of re re, uh, refreshing, I guess, that the scientific societies are trying to change the game, the funding agencies are trying to change the game, and now you know, it's gonna take some time for those things to really become more um, integrated, I would say. But it, it, movement is happening, I would say. It's, it, it is evolving. Um, and I think what, what we need at this point is more amplification of the messages you've been hearing here within the community. I mean, I would say, in, I would challenge you, not just uh, as you challenge us, take, you know, to get people off the review committees or have, you know, to say, I'm not gonna be on a review committee because it's not diverse. I would say every time you have an opportunity to bring up this conversation of what you've heard here in a scientific conversation, it will help to amplify the impact of what the agencies and the, and the societies are trying to do. Please. Hello, thank you very much for your talks. Um, I have a general comment. Uh, I've been attending several of these types of uh, events across the EGU editions. Unfortunately, I've never been to AGU. And uh, I'm very much interested in the diversity issues and uh, especially regarding gender differences. And, but one thing I noticed through the last few years that every time that we talk about minorities, most of the people who are attending these talks are part of the minority. And one of the first things I noticed before asking this question, I looked around and I saw that we are mostly women and there are very few men if we talk about the gender diversity. So I was wondering if there is a way for AGU, for example, or if something is going on with AGU to encourage the non-minorities to attend events like these that talk about minorities. Because as long as I'm a woman, I try my best to fit in the, in the, in the system. I think a lot of work should be done also from the other side. Um, and I'm very happy that there are some men in this, in this session that can make a difference also in the future. I don't know if you have comments regarding that. Thank you. One comment I would make is that you know, the, the problem with these meetings is that there are a lot of competing uh, interests going on at the same time. And you know, people sometimes have to choose their science over the other non-scientific things that may be going on. Um, AGU last, at its last fall meeting scheduled a union session that was unopposed on broadening participation and diversity. It, it was the only thing going on during the lunch hour, um, or right after the lunch hour, on one of the five days of the meeting. And, and as a result, it had a very large audience. I would say, I don't know, Chris, you know, in the thousands? Thousands of people who attended to hear similar kinds of discussion and messaging about the importance of these issues because there was nothing else, no one had an excuse, let's put it that way. They couldn't say, oh, I had to go to see a poster, you know. So, I, I mean, there's those kind, those kind of strategies that you can use to, to make it more, uh, more of an opportunity to participate. But I, I know what you're saying. It's, it's frustrating, yeah. I'll just add that yesterday on the short course for unconscious bias, um, there were 40% men in the room and uh, this is the first time we had such a broad representation of men when we did the, this voluntary course. So it's a good sign that people are interested, and it's just not women that are interested, but a broader group of people. I, do you have any, any other comment? Or No, I, I just would like to second what uh, Jill just emphasized, uh, in, uh, because uh, we have indeed many competing events. Uh, the only competing, uh, no, the only events that had no competition during this week uh, were the medal lectures, the events at lunchtime, the medal lectures, uh, and uh, there was only one non-scientific, not purely scientific event, which was the conversation with uh, Ilaria Kappa and Mario Monti. This kind of event that we are having today is not purely scientific, uh, and it's competing with the scientific events. So, I, me too, I think that this is the reason why the audience is relatively limited. Even if, uh, if I look at the number, this is a very big room, if I look at the number, just for my curiosity, uh, when I started the session, I counted, and I think we are about 70. This is my, just my guess. 
And uh, the number is not bad for, as I said, a non purely scientific event with other events in competition. I'm pleased to say that we are considering at EGU a similar initiative like AGU did uh, to try, maybe the next year, to schedule this session with uh, no competition. Of course, it's, it's a it's a decision, it's a council decision, so I cannot anticipate anything, but I just would like to say that I got your point. Uh, Claudia, you have, a, I would say, the last one. So yeah, It's not a question, it's actually a comment. It's a, a suggestion and maybe a challenge. So when you attend these uh, events like this and some other, like the training course on unconscious bias or some other, why don't you try to bring along one of your male colleagues, one of your friends? Just bring yourself, try to bring diversity into these audiences. Thank you. Yeah, this is a good point, yes. <laughs> okay, with that, I, I'm closing this, the first part of this session, but I, I'm pleased to remind you that we start again at uh, 4.15 in about half an hour from now. We still have uh, three talks plus an introduction by the AGU president, Robin Bell. Thank you very much, and see you in 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes, 25 minutes here. Thank you. Well, welcome back to everybody. I'm Robin Bell. I'm president of the AGU, and it's really my pleasure to be the, um, one of the co-conveners here and to be able to welcome you back. I've, had the ple I've been working in geophysics for about 35 years now, and it's really been wonderful to watch the change and watch those moments where we can really make progress and move things forward, and I actually have goosebumps because I think, you know, this is a moment where we've seen change that's fostered a little bit in our small sub-communities, really bumping up to a higher level where we can see it cascading from the things that EGU is doing back to smaller uh, societies across Europe and into institutions across. So it's really wonderful to see the avalanche that you two have helped start with your efforts here at EGU. So thank you very much. I just wanted to share, you know, today I, I had one of those awful moments where you watch this room fill up and you suddenly realized it was just men asking questions. And that happened to me once before and I realized you can make small interventions that can have a big impact. I didn't do anything useful today. I got in the line and I didn't get a question answered. But, but instead of telling that story, I thought I'd tell the story of a time where I went to a meeting and I saw it start. It was a couple day workshop and I saw it happening. None, no women were answering, asking questions. And so at the first coffee break, I went to the senior woman in the room and I challenged them all to make sure they asked questions. And the first next session was something I knew almost nothing about, but I asked the first question. And the other senior woman, women made sure that we started asking questions. And by after lunch, we had the junior women putting their arms up. That's the other thing I've learned, is that we were all trained to raise our hands like this, kind of like the queen. Turns out that we should be raising our hands like this, because then everybody sees us. So I think you know that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing opportunities to have impacts on a small scale, but also having impacts even by if you can talk to one or two people about what's going on. Um, we can make a difference and we can actually change things. So now I'm utterly confused. Who's going first? Who's going first? Julia. So here we have our first talk by Julia. Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, I must say that I'm not very familiar with these kind of sessions, and uh, actually uh, has been the most difficult talk to prepare in my life. First. Also, yes. Second, uh, I'm so happy to have a chance to discuss with you about some issues we have in Italy, but I think are very common in many European countries. Uh, so, uh, this is a bit uh, dedicated to Italy because this is my own country. I think I know much more than other countries. Uh, but 
I hope will be inspire also some comments from you because these are really general issues, serious issues for our continent, I think. Even if it's just fundamental science, which is at the border of the interest of many politicians worldwide. So, uh, how you can go with this, I think. Yeah. So, first of all, who I am. Uh, this doesn't go up. Uh, yeah, because otherwise. Ah, it works anyway, sorry. So, uh, uh, this is the outline, who I am and why I became interested in diversity and equality. I must say that I've been pushed by some people too here, uh, sitting in this audience. Uh, the case of Italy, why we are underperforming, and by underperforming I mean in, uh, uh, I think we can do much, much better. Uh, this is my in interpretation of underperforming. Uh, so th there is a quite a frustration behind this term. And then actions to be taken by Italians, but I think also this is valid for other European countries uh, in general, and so by, be, by people sitting here. Maybe they have better ideas than mine. Uh, so who I am? Well, I am a, uh, a professor in structural geology at the University of Padova, and uh, I was lucky to receive two of these European Research Council grants on earthquake mechanics. And uh, I must add, I have a very view through the bottom, a bottom view of the diversity and equality and research and development issues. So it's a very, very, it's a, the very view, the, bot, the very, very bottom view. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, these are easy to say, but uh, I, uh, the reason why is I don't think there are any kind of uh, differences of, of, there are of course, but they're all equal. And so I don't think there are more or less skilled people because of gender, age, and nationality. That's the first clear point, but someone is forgetting this. And I work and live in an underperforming country, for sure. I think at, Italian, uh, at the European level, we can do much better. And uh, my understanding of all this is because of the presence of underperforming countries. Well, uh, this will accelerate the disaggregation of our continent. And, you know, Europe is uh, in decline now in the last 120 years, basically from the First World War, and it's going worse and worse for European. Uh, and I think uh, we also did good things, and so I think Europe can still have a role in the future. And uh, this decline is uh, in uh, absolute numbers. If you just look at it, which is the luxury of uh, uh, the luxury of countries, which is spending money for fundamental research or research and development at a larger scale. So this is an, 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 just a diagram showing how Asia, of course, passed us for many several years ago, and now it's going worse. And United States are there, but Asia will, or perhaps already now, passed in total. The, in total, in terms of billions of dollars spent in research and development, most of this money goes, you know, to army to, you know, to military and uh, in private development. Uh, but then uh, if you look also in terms of uh, relative values, Europe is not in a good position. Uh, about, uh, you know, 2% or 1.5% is spent in research and development in European countries. Of course, this is um, in 2010, but things are not changing at all. Uh, and these are the, and the Americas, of, uh, the, those are spending more. And so this is just, a, you know, give you a feeling of the decline. And I will talk about the case of Italy. Um, why Italy? Of course, because I'm Italian and so I know better this, but it doesn't matter. But actually science was invented there uh, by Galileo. And actually was a full professor at the university where I work now. And uh, he did a fantastic work also in popular dissemination. Uh, the best, for probably the best books written in that century were written by Galileo, in Italian literature, I'm talking. So he's just a genius. And of course, uh, he was forced to abuse his findings because he's of his popular dissemination activity and because he didn't want to get burned, because uh, at that time, Italians were burned if you do stuff like him. Um, Actually, it's Giordano Bruno, was born in Rome in 1600, talking of many 
stars and so on. But that is something. So it was not a good time for, uh, for, you know, for scientists in Italy already for, for centuries ago. And uh, if you look uh, where people in the world spend money for research and development, you can see the situation, the arrow indicating Italy is about here, where uh, on, in the abscissa you will see, in the x-axis, you will see the research and development percentage of the gross domestic product, and here in the ordinate axis, the number of uh, professionals in research per million inhabitants. So we have here Italy, and then you can see with uh, big numbers of uh, researchers, but also of, let's say, at this point also money, Per, per inhabitant in Finland, all the Scandinavian countries, the virtuous countries. And the size of the circle is proportional to the amount of money that is spent every, in, in this case, in 2017. So you can see the big balls of United States and uh, China here, but also Japan and many other countries. And if you look how in the last 10 years, uh, not really the last, but this is what I found from 2000, 2010, uh, this is the research and development percentage of gross domestic product in these years. Italy is standard, is, usually is at about 1, 1.2%. Uh, you can see the steadily growth of China. And of course, Japan is up there. Well, uh, of course, there are a lot of reasons of this and of the limited public and especially private Italian investment in research and development, and uh, also of merit meritocracy. Uh, it's a complicated word to explain. Uh, I have my understanding of this, but of course there is a lot of behind this diagram and the fact that Italy has few strong research infrastructures and known Italian universities are in the best to under in the world, and the catastrophic uh, results for Italy in the ERC are related to this, meritocracy and little money, and at least. And then there are other, other things. Um, so this is the European Research Council result. Uh, this is just the last two years with starting grant, consolidator grants, but uh, these are grants where you be, uh, single people to do fundamental research in, uh, in any field uh, from science to, uh, let's say, philosophy, whatsoever you want. Well, uh, uh, you can get up to 2.53 million euros. And uh, well, uh, these are the countries. United Kingdom is up there. Uh, it gets about 200, almost 200 grants over 1,000 down here. And uh, these are the host institutions, host institutions. And it really gives you a feeling of what are the strong countries in research. So the, the countries that attract uh, the, the scientists. And Italy got only 41, is here, okay? And uh, if you divide the number of grants per million inhabitants of that country, Switzerland is up there. There are, you know, nine grants per million inhabitants. Italy is 0 0.7, okay? And in between, you have Britain with three. And uh, so basically what we see from this is, I think, uh, this Champion League, of research is laying bare the inequalities of the European research system. And of course, I'm not showing here what's happening in, the, in Romania, Bulgaria, and other countries in the east of Europe. Now, are Italians bad researchers? Uh, well, these are the host institutions. I'm not talking of the researchers here. But if you put now the nationality of the uh, people that got this grant, well, Italian researchers on average, but this is a diagram for the last year, but uh, I, you can do the same for previous years, are just there like British and French. I mean, there is about 1.5 Italian researchers every million inhabitants that get this grant, like in United Kingdom. Uh, of, there is an interesting case for uh, Netherlands. There are really a lot. So I think they, maybe they're more intelligent, I don't know. Uh, now, this diagram instead shows the movement of uh, people in these grants. And if I st stop in the first one, this is Israel. Uh, so in this uh, diagram here is showing the how are these moving to us institution of other countries. So there are very few Israeli citizen, Israeli citizen that go abroad, let's say. They like to spend their money and run the research in their own country, which is in green. Um, if you go to Italy, it's 50-50. So 
So 50 remain, 50 go. And what is really worse, this is really worse for Italy, is that very few come to Italy, very, very little, compared to other countries where, for instance, Switzerland uh, is impressive. About 75% of all the grants are people coming from abroad that go to Switzerland. So this is really amazing. So after fourth century, Italy is still not an, open, an inviting place for researchers. Uh, why don't come or don't remain? Well, I, I don't want to speak much about my own country, but you should, clearly we have issues about the public depth. And red means bad here. And in fact, you can see what other European call us as the pigs, Portugal, Italian, Greece, and Spain, which have a huge depth. And, uh, and because of the depth, uh, well, there, is limited, there are limited and irregular funds for research and development. It's difficult to make any research and development plan, recruitment plan, also for our universities. We don't have, it's very complicated. And because of this, as I, of this, as I told you before, there are few large infrastructures. And again, the problem that we are not strong at the world level in terms of academy. So, and then there are meritocracy issues. Um, because, you know, unfortunately politics has a lot, a lot to do. Uh, we have many managerial positions in research and development that are often given based on political merits and not scientific ones. Of course, these managers don't have a vision. At least this is what I think from the bottom. And the recruitment system has been improved a lot in the last years, but still must be improved. We need good people. And uh, being older is often better than being smarter, according to the, the new regulation we have sometimes. And some permanent positions are not advertised out, even in Italy, they're just lost in some ministry documents. So only people that know about will apply. And uh, many documents are written just in Italian. So why people from abroad should come? And sometimes are pretty complicated also for Italians to understand. And then there are other issues that are very, very huge, and I, but they're too technical. I don't want to lose time there. The other, the other problem is, of course, related again to economy, to social issues. Uh, you know, the countries of South and Western Europe, they have big problems with unemployment. And so if the researcher comes to Europe, uh, come to Italy from abroad, perhaps he has a family, his partner, what can do in Italy? It's much easier to find a job in the United Kingdom for instance, than uh, in Italy. Um, there are, of course, good things about Italy. You have probably one of the best uh, educational public system in the world, so we, all, we are continuously producing good students, I still. Uh, the public health system, perhaps, is one of the best of the world. We have a very high life expectancy because of many reasons. And, okay, I'm Italian, for me, it's the best country in the world. Uh, you might disagree. <laughs> but. <laughs> And then there are also some good things that happened in the recent years, and I must add, because actually ERC had a role here. And uh, there were very positive influences, influences from the European Union and uh, European research and development programs. And uh, one of these is uh, to attract Italians that went abroad. Well, Italians, but not only Italians, uh, they are allowed by the law to pay less taxes if they come back in our country, at least drain back what we lost. Um, and then uh, they get, the people that get an, one of these grants, ERC from the European Research Council, they get a permanent position as an associate or full professor, permanent positions. And Italian universities and research institutions uh, do, actually they do enjoy, but only here and there. There's not a structural thing like you, you can find in several British universities, for instance, of strong research groups and individ and, or individuals. And also these Italian universities, they're doing a lot of effort to attract people from abroad with what we call direct calls. Well, this is something impossible to think 15 years ago. It was impossible to think that something like this happened in my country. Meritocracy, it was a bad word, and still is in many places. And I think this is not only the case of Italy in our Europe. 
And uh, also, the Italian government introduced uh, the financial support to the university based on the evaluation of scientific production. That is, uh, this is very, very important, I think, to stimulate many universities to hire good people. And also, this is a very, very important. I think uh, we are person. Recruitment is the most important thing. It's more important than money. Well, uh, eventually, we, we have panel members of recruitment system that have a CV. Before, until 2010, anybody almost <laughs> could be part of that bloody panel, OK? And uh, this at least is impeding to, impeding to people without CV to be part of recruiting panels, as it happened in Italy for decades. And this is why our universities are so behind in the system. Academics are very responsible of the situation. It's not only politicians. And uh, so action to be taken by Italians or in your own country, perhaps you have similar issues, and the audience. Um, OK, uh, this is a very direct slide. But uh, of course, the result is of wrong, I think, political choice, economical choice, industrial choice. Italy is the second manufacturing country in Europe, traditional manufacturing, but we don't have really high tech. And there are choices that have been done in the 60s and 70s that killed Italy in that sense. Uh, this, these are the last okay, we, we, we had. And uh, so these guys are votes by Italians. So you are not a good audience to speak about these things. Um, and then, of course, the surge of populist parties, uh, and Italy is always a sort of experiment in these things. Already it was in the 20s with the fascism. We were the first to invent it. Um, OK, populism is not always this. It's not really a bad thing by itself. The problem is that, well, uh, they have some anti-scientific views sometimes. And also, they have very critical positions with the European Union. And it's partly understandable, I must say, as a, as a citizen. Europe is so far away to, to the people, I think, many times. But as I told you before, in uh, our fantastic world of the academy, it really helped us. To, to improve things. Well, uh, what I would do, I mean, this is my dream, of course. We need a Minister of University and Research and Development, something if you want to push. And we would put at this top the best Italian research manager. And actually, we have fantastic women that can do this job. They don't work in Italy, but we have them, um, like in CERN. Um, I would push for this. And, and then increase the 2.2. Of course, we need more money, but we have to explain why to the citizen why we need more money, <laughs> we, since we have so many issues in my country. And we should make more responsible university of the people they hire. Um, so but this is something we can do already from the bottom, I think. Even if the law sometimes is crazy, I think. Uh, and then support private companies that invest seriously, I mean seriously, in research and development. Uh, in many years in the past has been a joke, the way the people from the industry were spending the money in research and development. They were basically baking car, um, uh, buying cars uh, or stuff like that. Um, now, uh, but female or male, researchers are an endangered species in Italy. And so what we can do from the bottom? So there is something we can do and as professional research. And uh, surely it's to maintain high educational standards the best as we can. And explain, uh, yes, exploit at best our limited resources. So uh, yes, we have to select from the very beginning motivated from the PhD level, excellent candidates, and we do have. Uh, and also, they must be involved in something that is more ambitious in terms of projects, research projects, of sometimes happens in our universities. And of course, we have to help these people to submit proposals, push them to do it, and uh, in also for competitive and infrastructural grants. And uh, we also need uh, to improve also our man also the administrative staff for the preparation of this project and other things, and management. In many cases, they don't speak in English, so it's a, it's a problem. They only know Italian. Um, then of, we need to make this uh, recruitment system even more transparent. And I would think also we need to hire people that can have a vision in research, at least in, in talking about the academy. And uh, perhaps also the Unitarian universities must be more attractive and think how to help families of researchers wishing to move to Italy, relocations and jobs. 
This is a real issue, I think. Um, collaborate more in the industry, but this is uh, something you can discuss mo much more. And popular dissemination. Uh, this is very difficult but to do, uh, but we need to explain really, explain really well why we should spend more here for research and development. Um, and then we should stop complaining. There are no excuses which we must act. If we wait, decision makers, nothing will happen. That's my, my feeling after, uh, I'm 52 years old now, so I've seen a bit. Um, so what should the virtuous European countries, you know, and why, why they should help us, uh, Italy or all the others, we are there. Well, uh, do we want a Europe where the strong become stronger and the weak weaker? I don't understand why. Or oh, we are so selfish. Uh, why in the performing countries should pay for their research performing in the other virtuous countries if the latter will not care about the other countries? Are we all Europeans or not? Um, should not the diversity of views, experience, and expertise make better and more innovative research? Should not Europe's innovation and competitiveness benefit from this diversity? I'm insulting your intelligence by reading this, but um, I'm touched by these things. Um, Maybe also underperforming countries can help the virtuous ones. I think yes. Uh, and this is the last slide. Uh, so what this community can do, we are a small community compared to all this research and development business. Um, and also geoscience uh, is there, I think, in terms of amount of money compared to you know, nanotechnologies, of course, and, and much, much other things happening outside. Uh, but what I would think is uh, perhaps we should think to prioritize solid projects with those institutions in, in, uh, in countries that are underperforming. And like sometimes it's done for gender equality issues and should be done for gender equality issues. And uh, given the large unemployment of these countries, consider to cover the extra cost of the move of the family members to, of these European countries. And in the case, for instance, of ERC, why not thinking to help, you know, to put extra budget, like is done for scientists coming from out of Europe. And uh, consider dedicated grants, also for fundamental science, for collaborative research and project proposal between institutions from Virtus and with the underperforming countries. But these are just things. And then what is the role, actually, it's a question I have for you, can do in all this of the European Geoscience Science Union and uh, yes, to help, you know, this kind, uh, to decrease this kind of diver the inequality or disequilibrium between virtuous and less virtuous countries. So thank you for your attention. We have time for a, a question or two, if anybody. Can you go to the microphone? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I forgot to tell, give you the directions. <laughs> no, no, it's always useful. <laughs> Giulio, the, the, the talk was outstanding. I really liked it. In particular, I liked uh, your suggestions. And uh, there, is, uh, was, there are some additional things that I would like to briefly say. First, uh, I think another problem for working in Italy is the average salary, which is related to the public debt, but not only to the public debt. We have uh, an average salary in Italy that is not attractive for for persons working in other countries. Also, there is to say that in Italy, we have, uh, most of the universities are public, and therefore, we cannot freely choose uh, the person that we hire. So you said the university must be made responsible for the person they hire, but we cannot freely choose. We are obliged to follow strict procedures to ensure transparency and the quality of opportunity, which is much fine, but on the other hand, we cannot hire uh, people uh, who are married, or today, just today, the highest court has issued a sentence that seems to change this. But up to yesterday, we couldn't do that. So we cannot offer to a grantee a uh, position for a relative. And, and therefore, there are, I think, uh, m more profound structural limitations, which I suggest uh, should be taken into account but by the European founding agencies. I don't have a solution, but I think that uh, we should find a way, if we really want, and we want that, to integrate Europe, to form a solid European Union, 
we should find a way to overcome these barriers and also the language barrier because I think uh, that another good reason for our underperformances is the language barrier because more, many of our students unfortunately still have problems in writing a good proposal. They write excellent proposals in Italian but when they translate to English, you know, the quality suffers. I, I wonder whether you consider also these structural limitations, meaning uh, the average salary and the fact that we must follow strict and transparent hiring procedures. Yes, uh, and then actually that was one of my dreams, the fact that, <laughs> uh, you know, in, uh, I have been working for three years in the University of Manchester and they just hire what they need. Very simple. And, and this makes the system very smooth in terms of people know what they have to do and it's more clear and everything. And this also allow you to open new fields of research uh, while we are forced inside these small uh, things that are called uh, scientific uh, disciplinary, I don't know even the words. Uh, so you, if you're a structural geologist, okay. If you are a, I don't know, paleontologist, okay. But if you are a geomacrobiologist, there are no positions to in these things. But this is a very Italian thing. And so this is something that we should perhaps work to change. Um, regarding the salaries, uh, I would say yes and no. I mean, the government now for people from abroad allow to you know, to, to don't pay part of the taxes for four or five years. And this is, has been introduced recently. Um, so, of course, uh, we have that at depth and so on. So, but uh, I, my feeling is that we can do a lot from the base still. And about the proposals, of course, more experienced people can help the young ones. And I must say that this, the young students I have now uh, in Italy, many of them, they really speak a very good English, or much better <laughs> than I do uh, in the master. And they write their thesis in English, the master thesis. And I think, uh, but they already think to go abroad. Already, uh, my daughter is nine years old, and they class, they discuss where they will go, which is interesting, but <laughs> I, I think it's a bit strange. One more question, and please go to the microphone so we can all hear. I think I, I know the answer why Italians live longer. It's because of Maranzano La Parmigiana. <laughs> the question is the following. I mean, we discussed by email, Giulio, and Italy in terms of performance is in the middle of the 46 European country. It's in the middle upper part. I mean, uh, the question is, I mean, you always aim to attract talents from the top club, okay? And but talents in Europe, they don't have country. You find extremely productive and intelligent and novel creative people everywhere. What do you do to attract people which are in the same or lower league? Uh, so I, I missed the last part. <laughs> they attract the melanzana, I remember, the eggplants. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do to attract people? I mean, you say that you want to attract people from higher league. But what do you do to attract people in the same or lower um, performance league? I think uh, uh, all this concept is uh, dangerous. I want to say, of course, to, to protect my, my own country, but this will make a two-speed Europe. And uh, answer is what we have. And I think we should think to level. I don't know what the interest of France or Germany, the strong countries, is. Now Britain is not anymore in the party. Um, but uh, I don't know what these people are thinking. Telling you. Uh, so why what, what this interest for, for us to have uh, the eastern countries behind? Um, I think that we see, to, uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, really, uh, <sighs> I mean, we have the Champions League in, uh, in Europe, but the money is given to the football clubs, is given to the power of the club. Uh, in the NFL, it's different. They can choice, you know. I mean, I, we, I think we have to think a different kind of market, <laughs> but this goes to other things. Uh, okay, so I think I we're gonna have, have to, perhaps. There, there's, oh, do you have a quick question? Yeah, go for it. On the theory that we wanna make sure we have a diverse set of people asking questions. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, I have a, a comment, not just to you, Julie, but everybody, because you put a photo of some politicians. So I would just like to remind you all that there is a European elections coming up, 23rd to the 26th of May. So as a rhetoric question to you all here in the room and to you, Julie, are you voting? Sure. <laughs> a lot of people die that allow me to vote. Okay, I will we have one do more it. question. That way you answered the question. Here we have another question. <laughs> we're going to let one more question, and then we're going to... It's going to have to be a quick answer. I, I just have a comment. I, um, I'm very happy that there is all this analysis going on on the Italian situation, but I think in general scientists are keen to find uh, uh, difficult, uh, I mean, I mean complex uh, uh, solution to complex problems. Italy has a very complex problem, and so it's, uh, it's very difficult to give uh, uh, a straight uh, recipes. I think that uh, a, a problem uh, uh, with applying uh, to European funding is not only uh, our uh, lack of capability of write good proposals, but it's also uh, a systematic internal problem related to the fact that we don't have a system inside Italy. Every, uh, we don't have founding institutions that are run from scientists, so every founding which is national comes more or less in a political way, and that's the way we actually uh, create the infrastructure that then we have to use to compete for European funding. So the, 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 the system is really, really complex, and it's, it's difficult to find an easy solution, but uh, the lack of uh, a kind of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, way, of systematic way, uh, to, to make system like uh, in Germany, in France, where maybe scientists each, uh, eat, uh, hate each other, but at the end they okay. cooperate each other, they are forced to cooperate each other. Right. This doesn't exist in Italy, okay? I think you win, that wasn't a question. So, <laughs> thank you very much. No, <laughs> okay, our next, our next presentation is from Barbara Romanowitz who's going to speak about the very much following on similar theme, uh, quality of opportunity in European research council competitions. Okay, good afternoon. So um, I am here, I'm supposed to say who I am to begin with, and uh, I, um, I am a seismologist, a global seismologist, and I s share my time between um, the University of California at Berkeley and the Collège de France in Paris, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to represent the European Research Council as a member of the Scientific Council of the ERC. And so this is uh, what uh, my presentation is going to be about, and you should look at me as one, uh, one of the council and ask me questions, if you want, or comments uh, to the council, basically. So, um, first, just a quick slide for those of you that are not familiar. What is the ERC? Um, it, it was founded, uh, it's, it's been in operation in just over a decade, 12 years, and it was founded by visionary scientists, for the scientists, to support excellence in frontier research um, through bottom-up, individual-based, pan-European competitions. So it was founded to um, kind of start from scratch in the European landscape and devise a funding system for excellence in science that uh, with the idea of leading the way uh, for um, country-based institutions to follow uh, suit. So um, no networks, I mean that is a fundamental idea, support for the individual scientists, no predetermined subjects, bottom up, no quotas of any sort, global peer review, and support for frontier research in any fields of science and humanities. And the scientific quality is the only driving light, uh, the only criterion aiming for excellence. It's governed by an uh, independent scientific council with 22 members, including a president who is also a scientist, and uh, who, um, the council has full authority over the funding strategy and valuation. Um, and it's supported by, of course, staff from the ERC executive agency, whom I should thank for helping me prepare some of these slides. So 
very clearly where we, st st where we start is no positive discrimination, no affirmative actions, no quotas. And this is a fundamental principle. So we're not going to solve all the problems of Europe. We're trying to um, you know, fight for excellence and, and promote excellence. It has sometimes some uh, you know, secondary uh, uh, kind of uh, consequences, which I'm going to talk about, uh, that may or may not uh, be re resolvable easily. So um, just also quickly, how we function, we have three competitions uh, according to uh, uh, basically age or uh, you know, seniority from uh, the time of PG, the starting grants, consolidated grants and advanced grants, and then uh, 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 relaunched uh, last year uh, uh, synergy grants, which include um, collaborations between several principal uh, investigators. I won't go into more details about this, but dive into the topic of today's um, symposium is what is diversity and inclusion for the ERC? And um, the goal is to, um, I mean, we have two challenges to contribute to a truly inclusive European culture of competitiveness in science. One is the strengthening of participation of researchers from Europe's less research performing regions. And also, of course, giving equal opportunity to men and women in all of the ERC competitions. And the main issues we have uh, at the inclusion diversity issues at the ERC are the underrepresentation of women, but primarily in the submission rates, which vary also across scientific areas and career stages. But I'd like to stress that success rate is actually not a problem. I will show some statistics. And then, of course, the under, so-called underperforming countries in both submission rates and success rates that have you know, become uh, pretty clear over the uh, decade of existence of the ERC. Uh, what is nice uh, is that ERC collects uh, and analyzes data for every call and year. So we now have 10 years, over 10 years of data to, to analyze, to see what the trends are and where the issues are. And so I'm going to present, and all these data are public, by the way, they are available on the ERC website, which is also quite unique, uh, because if you look for ki these kinds of data among other um, you know, funding agencies, uh, etc., it is much harder to get. So um, what are the approaches? Um, okay, so uh, the design of the program, PI-driven, any nationality from anywhere in the world, all scientific fields, evaluation criteria based on PI track record and scientific pro project, research environment, group, host institution is not an evaluation criterion, contrary to my, what might be the perception sometimes. And we try to strive for a diverse panel composition in terms of discipline, nationality, gender, and other criteria. Uh, we grant exceptions to eligibility windows. Uh, we uh, allow maternity leave, 18 months per child, regardless of whether you take the maternity leave or not. Paternity leave equal to the leave actually taken. Uh, we have uh, exceptions for long-term sickness, military service, and care for sick relatives. And then um, external approaches via the ERC Scientific Council include uh, discussions uh, that have um, basically resulted in the formation of two working groups, um, one about gender balance and the other one about the so-called widening, uh, um, participation, widening participation working group uh, to uh, try and improve the issues with underperforming countries. Uh, so, in terms of the gender balance, um, the kind of actions that are taken is uh, development of a gender equality plan, uh, looking at the numbers, uh, looking, uh, discussing uh, the trends, uh, taking part in international gender summits, um, and organizing sessions at international policy conferences such as the ESOF, and at uh, major discipline-oriented conferences such as EGU, we have uh, had um, um, we had a, a short course here at EGU and uh, um, um, a uh, uh, an open session, right? Uh, 
town hall, yes. Uh, and then in terms of underperforming countries, we, um, we try to organize high-level events in, uh, in uh, many of these countries and organize meetings with national and regional politicians, policymakers, and researchers. We organize visits to ERC projects located in these countries, and we try to promote national initiatives, and I will talk about one of them, which is the ERC Visiting Fellowships. So in terms of gender, what has happened since the uh, start of the ERC? What have been some of the measures? 2007, so the first the beginning of the ERC, um, extension of eligibility by 12 months per child born after the PhD. 2010, extension of eligibility by 18 months per child born before or after PhD awards. So trying to kind of expand uh, the eligibility criteria. 2013, um, we removed a, the scientific leadership potential in the self-evaluation section of the proposal, and uh, in 2014, we introduced a model CV template in applications forms. It is not uh, required to use it, but it provides a kind of uh, reference, uh, you know, standard kind of way of presenting your CV, uh, as it is well known that women tend to under estimate uh, their own accomplishments. And we are discussing within the ERC Council right now whether to not make it obligatory. Uh, in 2015, um, we removed the eligibility extension, uh, um, then introduced the care of sick relative uh, counts for extension of the eligibility, and then also introduced the measure that the track record focuses on five to ten publications, so uh, also to try to normalize uh, the, um, you know, the appearance of the, uh, of the CV and the, and the track record. Uh, in 2016, um, the gender equality uh, or the uh, working group um, introduced a video on unconscious bias, which uh, has been very successful. It's been shown to all panel members at every call. Uh, there is always a, um, a presentation of this uh, unconscious bias vi video, and we are now talking about a new one because... Uh, especially panel members that have been there for a couple of years can get a little bored. So, uh, you know, renewing it and, and uh, maybe uh, focusing more on the issues of, um, of, what, uh, of what happens in the panels. Um, in 2017, some activities promoting equal opportunities or gender balance uh, are now eligible costs, uh, clearly, as clearly stated in the written work program. 2018, um, the unconscious bias training was extended also to the program officers. Two thirds of them have gone through it and the rest are in the process of doing it. And this year we have decided that uh, all program officers, the management and the ERC scientific council will do an unconscious bias training, sort of, uh, uh, kind of. Uh, so, um, what, uh, what can we do? So we have uh, 12 years of, um, you know, kind of data and two um, framework programs, FP7 and H2020. And um, uh, so in, uh, in the course of this, uh, uh, of, of this time, uh, we have seen some changes, right, which I will report us. So scientific, during FP7, Scientific Council members grew from 23% to 36%, so also an effort from the point of view of the scientific management to increase the, the contribution of women. Panel members, 28%, evaluated um, uh, 25%, of which uh, quite a difference between senior and junior. Grantees, 20%, and uh, in terms of scientific officers, 60% of women uh, during FP7. At age 2020, uh, the numbers have grown. Uh, the Scientific Council members, uh, 43%. Panel members have increased. Evaluated have increased, but not such so much. And uh, in terms of grantees, yes, that is a more significant uh, uh, increase. Uh, and the ERC scientific officers has slightly increased. 
So we can look at this in terms of, uh, of uh, statistics over the entire period. And here it is shown by type of call. So whether it's the junior, the starting grind, the consolidator, and the advanced. And then in gray, you have the total. So this is regardless of the, of the type of science, right, of the, of the disciplines. Uh, and um, you can compare the uh, first uh, six years and um, the last three, three years up to 2017. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, the difference in the um, success rate of, of uh, females has really increased between these two and these two. You look at the more um, you know, solid colors for the, for the success rate of females, and I would point out that now they're almost equalized. In fact, they are in total with some differences uh, in the, um, between the starting grants and the, uh, where it is still just a little bit lower, but in a, a consolidator in particular, whether that is significant or not, it's not clear, but it is, has been equalized. So if you compare with these calls, the difference is uh, encouraging. Uh, now by domain, uh, so this is life sciences compared to physic, um, physical sciences and engineering and social sciences and humanities, again comparing uh, this is, of course, the same total, but you can see the differences between the different um, domains. And again, PEs, which is, you know, are here, we are part of the PE, uh, is uh, quite improved. And there is uh, the main, uh, uh, all have improved, but in life sciences, uh, the uh, improvement uh, has, is a little less. Uh, now, by, uh, by type, uh, again, I mean a little bit more detailed in terms of uh, starting consolidator advanced grant. You see uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, and also in terms of the panelists here in the, the, um, the shaded ones, applicants in strong colors and then grantees, you see um, the um, uh, the, uh, the equalization in terms of applicants and grantees uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, figures. And oh, by domains, uh, yes, I think I'll just skip this. But anyway, the goals for the future is, I mean, the one um, important message that is coming from analyzing all these data is that the, um, interestingly, the success rate is now equal or even a little better for women, but we need more applications from women. They're, o they're always uh, lower, especially in the more senior, um, the advanced grant uh, competition. And um, also we need to make efforts to maintain diversity in the panels. And one problem that we have is that the men, when we invite um, someone to participate in the panel, uh, their acceptance range for men is larger than for women, uh, you know, significantly larger. And we need to maintain dialogue with the scientific societies to, um, you know, to, to help improve these quantities. Now, um, I'll switch to the other issue, which is the um, uh, equal opportunity in terms of, uh, of participations by uh, underrepresented countries. This is um, uh, the statistics of the evaluated proposals by host uh, institute country. And yes, you can see that the majority uh, comes from the EU 15, right? And uh, of course, they're breaking up here in terms of, of the different uh, calls. And, but, and also, um, and the EU 13 are uh, clearly very underrepresented. They're even much more underrepresented than some countries, some of the associated countries, so, uh, such as Switzerland, Israel, uh, Norway, and Turkey. And um, where is Italy here? Italy is, uh, yes, I mean, we discussed uh, this previously, that it is among the, um, still the high, highest uh, evaluation number of proposals. Um, if you look at the nationalities of the PIs, this is over uh, uh, 11 uh, 
a 10 year period plus a portion of 2018. Um, there are 17, 77 nationalities represented in the principal investigators. And again, uh, some of the leading countries are here. Here is Italy uh, and uh, a number of non-EU um, non um, associated or non-associated countries uh, are here in blue and uh, of course you have a number of countries uh, trailing behind quite significantly. Um, mobility um, in terms of, uh, of the grantees, uh, interestingly a lot of mobility from the US to Europe and not necessarily to, uh, I mean a lot of them to the lead uh, always leading countries, but uh, not necessarily. There are some that uh, go elsewhere, and uh, there is some mobility uh, primarily towards the main, um, you know, successful countries from, um, from other, um, uh, you know, smaller represented countries. This is uh, mobility of ERC grantees, right? So uh, where, when um, they get uh, their, uh, their grant, they can stay or they can move to another country or another institution. And uh, here you can see the, um, in, um, in blue is the inflow uh, coming in, in red the outflow, and for uh, most, uh, Countries, I mean, um, Julia showed um, a very similar uh, um, graph showing uh, the inflow into Switzerland, but Italy is still uh, a little bit more inflow, and uh, well, this gives you uh, an, an, an idea of um, what, what happens um, and who are the major losers uh, in ex here, Romania and Turkey is here, right? There's no inflow. Uh, just for interest of our community here, the distribution of the P10, which P10 is our geosciences panel uh, at the ERC, uh, the pro how they are distributed uh, by city, uh, with, of course, a concentration in uh, northwestern Europe, I would say, and uh, a few, um, uh, uh, some uh, scattered uh, around other countries. So, what approaches can we, or have been, or are we uh, kind of uh, you know, developing towards widening the European participation? Um, 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 uh, so, um, bringing back the most talented scientists from abroad with attractive research funding and salaries that are prospective candidates for ERC grants is one possibility. Focusing first on young researchers, that is the ones that apply for starting on consolidated grants, which is easier. And uh, uh, you know, we can do this, but uh, they, this will not happen without uh, them seeing the prospect of attractive long-term career paths. So, for example, the efforts that are done in Italy in providing them with permanent positions. Strengthening local support to ERC applicants and grantees. This is very important. Training days, workshops, seminars. Um, some countries are, have, uh, have basically instituted spe specific um, kind of, uh, um, have instituted specific uh, kind of, uh, I won't say institutions, not institutions, but it's uh, like cells which, uh, which help uh, uh, ERC candidates, um, you know, uh, prepare the grants. Uh, and, uh, you know, developing the, um, um, the possibility of uh, contact um, with, and, and exchange with, um, you know, uh, with uh, locally with those that already have hands-on ERC experience or um, directly with the ERC. Um, and then try to actively search for talented scientists and encourage them to apply with strong, well-prepared proposals, so of course with a lot of help. Um, and uh, in some countries what has happened is uh, uh, that uh, the uh, 
the ERC applicants that went um, through the step two, we have a, a two-step application process. Uh, and at step one, you can get a grade A to uh, pass to step two. And if you get a grade A but do not uh, get funded, you can get national su uh, support from your national institutions, um, uh, significant support, um, possibly at the level of uh, an ERC grant. And then there is this uh, lower uh, success level B, uh, where you can have still some significant support, and of course encouragement to reapply because, um, on a, again and again, when we um, um, when we talk or we uh, ask uh, uh, successful applicants um, to to present their experience with the ERC, there are often um, individuals that have tried two, three, four times to get an ERC, and uh, those that didn't get discouraged uh, often make it in the end. Uh, so I said I was going to talk a little bit about the visiting fellowship programs. This is an effort uh, to promote, um, uh, to, to basically set up um, and fund mobility programs to allow potential candidates for ERC grants to visit and gain experience with ERC-funded teams. So this is basically an effort to coach um, potential ERC candidates to write uh, strong proposals. And already we have nine countries uh, from uh, EU 13 participating, uh, well, uh, Belgium also, but uh, in, uh, that are participating in this, in this scheme. Uh, and one new one, uh, the, uh, the University of Bucharest, in starting um, uh, this year. So I don't know if I want to get into all the details, but what is currently proposed is uh, visits of supported visits of three to six months, um, and uh, this hasn't worked that well, as you can see from the um, results is that, uh, uh, in fact, at the bottom here, you see uh, in 2016 only 15, uh, one from Hungary, seven from Slovenia, seven from Poland. In 2017, this has grown to 27, but this is still very small numbers. Uh, and the average duration of the visit was 4.6. So um, we, we actively discuss this to try and, and see how we can improve it. And uh, from this, starting this year, the minimum duration will be one month because it has been um, thought that uh, maybe visits, longer visits can make it very difficult for people with uh, families uh, to, to basically go somewhere, and, you know, move for, for a significant amount of time. Um, the, um, there are other uh, guidelines. Uh, that is that if you participate in this program, you have to apply for an ERC grant in a specific time frame, usually around 18 months after you've participated in, in, the, um, uh, in this, and the costs are covered by the sending institutions. So I've already said something about the results, which are uh, quite uh, disappointing right now, and uh, so if anybody has any ideas how we can improve this, we are quite interested. Um, and so, yes, so these are some uh, just, uh, you know, uh, histograms uh, showing um, how, uh, you know, who is willing to host a researcher because that is the first step is that uh, the ERC grantees have to volunteer to accept a host, uh, to, ha to host a researcher. And, um, well, it's uh, distributed uh, again uh, uh, you know, but uh, there are even countries here um, in the EU 13 that uh, have um, um, been willing to help their own countrymen to, uh, and women to um, access to this. Um, and this is the destination countries where, where they actually have gone by scientific domain. You can get some idea of uh, most of them to England, um, or to United Kingdom, I should say and uh, quite a few to Italy, actually. I mean, these are very small numbers, so maybe not statistically significant. Uh, and so, just to say, there is the, a call, uh, and the next one this year is, is, going, is coming up uh, in May and June. So, uh, to finish, I think I would just uh, ask for suggestions on how we can encourage more women applications to the ERC 
which is a, um, you know, an issue, a real issue, and how we can, uh, and, you know, get more women to accept to serve on panels, which is also important um, for uh, improving the uh, gender balance at all levels. And of course, uh, the, perhaps the bigger, even bigger problem we have is to increase the number of applicants and their success rates from underrepresented EU 13 countries. Um, suggestions for the EGU allow scheduling of ERC short courses and town halls at times where most people can attend. And we have some evidence that lunch breaks work very well. We just had a, we just had a um, short course this year at lunchtime and the, the room was full. So, okay, I think I should stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Looks like you're going to get one from Jill. Uh, thank you, Barbara. I, I have a comment I, on your last question. I have a comment related to your last question about how to get more of the developing uh, countries uh, engaged. And I'm struck by the um, sort of the parallels um, with uh, in the U.S. with trying to support uh, scientists at tribal colleges and universities, mm -hmm. uh, which are also disadvantaged in terms of infrastructure and resources. And there are two thoughts that I have. One is, uh, and I know it's, it's difficult to um, build capacity at some of these institutions by bringing talent to the majority institution because the majority institution doesn't want to go back to the, uh, there's, there's less incentive for them to go back. Uh, and so the, it, it's not so much of a collaboration. Mm -hmm. But partnership projects where you, you require that they basically be co-equal uh, institutional partners is one way to help elevate the capacity and also increase understanding within the uh, advantaged institution as well. And I'm thinking that, you know, using models like what uh, AGU does with the Thriving Earth Exchange, where you basically are doing community-focused research, calls for community-focused research that is situated in some of the developing country geoscience-relevant topics, might be a way to um, encourage people in the um, already well-endowed in institutions and countries to find partners in those uh, less engaged countries, you know, to work with the scientists who are already working in that domain. So I, it, it might be a strategy to, to really encourage calls related to doing research in those countries that, that is relevant. Yeah, well, so the, the visiting program, you know, the, is, is trying to do a little bit of that. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, we could do more, I mean, within the boundaries of what the ERC is all about, which is PI-driven and excellence. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to our last presentation from Livu Manteco on crossing longitudes, how homogeneous is the approach, mentality, and perception to research across Europe. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so my, my name is Livu Manteco. I, uh, and together with uh, Claudia and Daniel, we are having, uh, are expanding more or less the previous presentation of Barbara to the normal research life, not to the top club. Because the top club is, uh, is very small, actually, in the, in the research community. And I want to speak about the normal researcher, actually, if you allow me. So here you have a disclaimer. We are researchers. We don't necessarily do statistics. Okay? So you see statistics in my talk, so I guess there are many other people who can do much better statistics. And in this statistics, you have to be aware there are mixtures of disciplines. And also because our interest goes, now it's expanding more and more from Earth and planetary sciences, we are getting more and more to, towards physics and astronomy, for instance. And these mixtures have consequences in statistics. But I've did the statistics with and without this, uh, these fields. And the conclusion is that the comparison is similar. You should not necessarily take the absolute values but the comparison between countries is still valid. 
And obviously, this is our perceptions that are not institutional. Although I'm fully sure that my, my, my university will support me in this, it's better to, to stay a little bit uh, out of, uh, of uh, the real, uh, our affiliations. Now, I'm using some very particular definitions, and I will remind to everybody uh, what Europe can be defined, and this is my definition, is this not necessarily an accepted definition. So, we always refer to, affili to, to let's say, to, to the countries of researcher affiliations. We do not refer to their nationality, okay? Because you have Germans working in uh, Switzerland, you have, uh, I don't know, it's always, uh, always the switch. Uh, if you look now in, into the names, and their affiliations, you realize that people move quite a lot around. So we refer always to affiliation, not nationality. And I'm, I will define EU15, because my experience is that 5% of the EU15 people know what EU15 is. Okay, so EU15 is affiliation in European Union member countries that joined before, before 2004, including the founding members and so on. And you have the list over there. I guess you understand what are the abbreviations. <coughs> EU13, in affiliation in European Union member countries that joined after 2003. So these are new European member countries. Okay, and that, then I will split Europe into, let's say, subjective parts. I will call Western Europe, it means affiliation in EU15 plus countries in the West, in the real West, which are not European Union members such as Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, Switzerland, Andorra, and Monaco. There is quite some, uh, Earth, uh, let's say, quite some Earth and Planetary Science research activity in Monaco, for the ones which don't know this. And, I would, and this includes Greece, eh? This will include Greece. So Greece is a Western country, in my definition. I know that Greek food is not really Western, and uh, it's my taste, so if you wish. But, um, this includes Greece and, and other, other South, South Mediterranean countries. Eastern Europe is EU13, plus all the other countries in the geographic east, which are uh, not European Union members, but they are associated or not with the uh, European Union. I did not include a statistic Russian Federation and Georgia for objective reasons. The first objective reason is that uh, I know very little about the Russian Federation and I don't dare to, to, to judge research in Russian Federation. And for Georgia, if we have colleagues from Georgia, they know that there is a, there is a complete mixture in databases in between the country Georgia and the United States state of Georgia because colleagues from the United States, they don't sign with the United States at the end. They, sound, they sign with Georgia, and then it goes to the country of Georgia. So if you don't know that, uh, it's, it's a nice... Uh, so I did not include Georgia in my... Uh, and this list does not include the uh, disputed uh, countries or territories. I'm very afraid to offend anybody, so... My apologies in advance if this grouping may create any inconvenience. But bear with me for the purpose of this talk. Why me? I've worked 12 years in, uh, in Eastern Europe. I've been uh, assistant to associate uh, professor at the University of Bucharest. And I have 16 years affiliations in, uh, in Western Europe. I'm currently professor of tectonics and sedimentary basins at uh, the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. I work with everybody, well, well not with everybody, there are 46 countries. I work with many colleagues in Eastern and West. So I know a large amount of opinions. And because I have mixed interest, I, I do not have to whisper around the corners when I say something about the West, okay, up nose people, or the East. Uh, I don't have to whisper, okay, I can say it directly, because I have mixed interest. Okay, but let's go a little bit to the normal research life, not the top of Europe, and understand something about the background publication research statistics. Let's look at directly on statistics, and I'll do it very fast with your permission. This is basically the total number of publications since the 1990 to 2018. Okay, West means EU15 plus, plus other West countries in this. East means EU13 plus other Eastern countries, okay? 
So as you see, uh, there is a, a steady increase in, in publications from 1990. is the normal increase due to because we are more productive or the publication pressure. It's a very increase to everybody, including in the, in the East, okay? But obviously such a, and obviously the largest number of publications comes from the, from the West. Obviously such a, such a direct, we have to normalize this data somehow, okay? Because the population is different, the number of researchers is significantly dif different. And I will show you a few ways to normalize this. We can normalize it per million inhabitants, like you've seen in the, in the other, other presentation. And then gives you a better image because it say, okay, but people in the in the in the east publish uh, less, but still quite. Uh, it's not very far away. It's not nothing. Okay, so they still publish quite a lot. And uh, we can normalize per GDP, and this tells a very interesting fact uh, that in general people publish according to the money they have. Okay, it's a direct correlation. Except, uh, except in, in the, in, in, uh, if you normalize with the East, uh, it's a little bit lower. So this was it's surprising to me because I, I never thought that. I thought that uh, we are researchers and we can publish. It doesn't matter how much money we have. But this is a direct correlation. I don't know how to explain it otherwise. How many authors do we have? So this is a little bit uh, the distribution of Earth and planetary size per number of authors. Countries have different interests in Earth and planetary sciences. Huh? I mean, uh, if you go to Iceland, for instance, uh, I think uh, almost the entire population works in Earth and planetary sciences. I mean, there are so many over there and so little the population that it's uh, completely distorted the, if you make the, the graph per population. So basically, you see there are a large amount of people working in Earth and planet uh, publishing in Earth and planetary science all over Europe including from the east, uh, so the graph is quite distributed. Okay, so Poland is here, uh, a large amount of publication. Uh, Turkey is here, a large amount of publication. Czech Republic, uh, even Romania is somewhere over here. In terms, no, sorry, in terms of number of authors. Okay, so there is quite, uh, quite a spread in here. The one, th one thing you have to be aware, the scale is logarithmic here. Okay, so I, in order to put everybody in the same place, the scale is logarithmic, so it's not real equality. Okay. Um, one other thing, let's normalize it per uh, million inhabitants, and then you see Iceland, uh, that everybody works in Earth and planetary sciences, more or less. <laughs> so it's quite a lot. And then you realize that the, the interest for Earth and planetary sciences is very high in, the, uh, in some, uh, some, uh, some of the non-European Western, non European Union Western countries. Okay. And that's why this might explain, for instance, in my views, the very high success rate on, uh, on some of these countries, okay? Because there is a very large population of people working in, uh, in Earth and Planetary Sciences. Good. And we can uh, do another trick. We can normalize it uh, per uh, to total number of publications per number of authors. You have to be very careful with this graph, okay? Because you see, it's much higher in the East in some places, okay? And this is not the number of publications per author. How is this calculated? I calculated all publications, I put in, in the West, all, pub, all publications that have at least one author in the West, okay? I put in the East at least one which is in the East, okay? No matter how many authors it is. And then when you divide it by the number of authors, what is happening, if you have one author from the East, then you get a number of one, if you have uh, four, ad, uh, four authors from the West, then you get 0 0.2, okay? So the more collaborative it is, the higher the number, okay? So this is a matter of the, of the amount of collaboration, what th these graphs that you see in here, okay? And in my experience, at least in, in the place which I'm working, what we see very often is that people go to, from the West go to the East, uh, generally when they work there, okay? which is decreasing nowadays, and people from the East go to the West for the know-how. There is very little people from the West which are searching for the know-how in the East. Okay? And this is actually not, does not reflect the current situation. But that's the reality. 
Another thing, we can look for collaborative publications. Uh, I mean, this graph doesn't tell me very much, okay? So the, it's a gradual increase from 1990 to today. Okay, it's, um, and uh, you see that the European Union framework program, the, com the common program has helped a lot, the EU 13, to be basically very collaborative in, in the same system. This has been very good for uh, EU 13. Now, that's another thing. Let's look a little bit of collaborative East-West publication. How much this represents of the total publication record? Okay, so what do I do? I take the collaborative publications and I make the percentage of the, the total collaboration record, uh, publication record, okay? So basically, if you look at this, basically in the Western publication record, the collaborative publication is somewhere at 7%, something like that. And this is influenced, obviously, by, uh, by geographical or uh, cultural uh, commonalities. I mean, obviously, you will expect that uh, that a researcher from, uh, from Austria, from here, will collaborate much more because he has a large amount of neighbors from, uh, from EU 13. Okay, and this is true. This is what you see over here. I blanked the names. I don't want to blame anybody for now. Okay, so uh, it's also a matter of culture. You would expect that uh, the, the Greek Cypriots will collaborate with Greek a lot. I mean, uh, and this is true also, this happens. But there are some things which I don't understand. There are countries which are in, in different time zones, which, have, which show two different collaborative uh, pattern. I mean, on the, on the left you have Ireland, on the right you have Great Britain. Great Britain is, I don't know, 4%, something like that. Ireland is almost 10% in the, in the publication record. So some are more collaborative than others, even in the same geographical area at far distances from uh, the east. Okay, so 7%, remember. If you look in the east, the average is 35%. Okay? So the people from the east have the six times higher tendency to collaborate with the west than the people from the west to collaborate with the east. Okay? So if you wish to define a true European integrated countries, I'm not sure who of, of these are, okay? So, evolution of uh, collaborative publications per time. I just selected a few countries which are the most relevant ones. They are blanked, so you don't know the names. Okay, so with, uh, with uh, let's say, with blue, you see the countries which have continuously increased their, uh, their uh, their collaboration with time, this continuous collaboration. With black is countries that have increased initially the collaboration, but since some time they are stagnant. And with red countries which have increased the collaboration, but since some time they decreased significantly. Okay, if you want, I can uh, simplify it this way. Okay, three trends. Okay, the, uh, the blue I define as scientific integration across Europe, so East gets integrated with the West. The, the black, I don't have a name, I call it recently stagnating. And the red is interesting. Okay, what is happening is many countries in the East, they don't necessarily, they decrease their collaboration with the West and they collaborate either more internally or more with other countries outside Europe. Okay, so we, we call, uh, you can call this either scientific nationalism, okay, if it gets to the countries it's themselves, or they, they realize they started to prefer to collaborate with other countries in, in the world. Okay, which is, and the other countries in the world is basically the United States, okay? So they increase collaboration with the United States and they decrease the collaboration with the East. Okay, I don't know if this is a good news for many people. Now, a few preliminary conclusions for Earth and Planetary Sciences. West is not fundamentally different from the East, okay, in terms of uh, production of publications. It's, it's more valid for the EU 13 and it's less valid for, uh, for more Eastern countries. But these observations, what for me, what is interesting, that it's basically the same, no matter the differences in various uh, national systems, strategies, uh, investments, okay? 
Julia was speaking about 1% investment. In the, in the EU 13, uh, there are countries which have 0.3% of GDP investment in research and development. Okay, so they publish no matter how much money they have. Okay, but in principle, East is far more collaborative than the West, by far. It, at least this is what the publication record says. Are these facts known or acknowledged? Do you know them? Let's see. Let's take a look on the European Geoscience Union, okay? It's a very quick look. I mean, this is praising the EGU. EGU is our home. EGU is where we all feel welcome. We always come, come here with open heart. It's also a nice city. It's also nice people, hardworking people who do a lot of voluntary work. Uh, journal editors which have increased, well, I mean, they did, did such a fantastic work that the, the ranking of their journal has exploded in the recent years. And I have only good things to say about, uh, about EGU. But you know, the, the more you praise somebody, the more you can also criticize it, okay? So that's the point. So the question is, everybody is integrated and benefiting from this effort? Let's look on the participation in the EGU, okay? So it's clearly dominated by EU15, the, the participation in the, in, in the EGU. I did not put here countries outside Europe. Okay, there is also other West. Uh, there is some EU13, uh, quite significant, and there is people from other East. Now, if you divide per total number of publication authors, then it's becoming a bit more uh, equilibrated. So basically people from, uh, that's, so basically this is normalized by the total number of publications authors, okay? So you can say is how much of this publication authors come to EGU, okay? So basically in Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, some, and something like that, is 16% uh, of the publications authors come to EGU. Now, in uh, EU 15, is something like 10, 11%. In uh, EU 13, is 7%. And, is, uh, and uh, in uh, EU, in the, more to the east, is uh, 4% presently. But much more I'm worried about this trend over here. It's decreasing. So the participation of the east to EGU assemblies is decreasing. Okay? relative to the number of their, public, uh, of their uh, publications authors. Now, if you take IEU 15 uh, uh, as, a, as a reference frame, and then you calculate how many people from the East should come, basically, from the ones who should come, it's uh, below 50%, they really come, and somewhere at 25% from the, from the East, they do come, okay? So basically, they don't prefer to come to, to the EGU assemblies, simply, okay? From the ones who should come, only 50% in year 13 come, and only 25% from the other East come, okay? So why is that? Why is this, why is this discrepancy? Why do people from the East don't, don't want to come to the EGU? Is it a problem of funding? Well, not really. I mean, if you look to the GDP, I mean, the GDP in the, in the, in the EU 13 and the East has exploded recently. I mean, there are countries in the, in the EU 13 which have a higher GDP than the EU 15. So it's not a problem of funding anymore. I'm not speaking about the top, uh, let's say, the top rich countries, okay? I'm just speaking about the average. Okay, just be, be careful. This, doesn't, this is just a very simple GDP approximation. It does not count in, uh, about the investment in research, okay, or other, uh, other factors. It's just a first order approximation. East goes to conferences? Yes, very much. I mean, uh, look on this one. Basically, what I did, I took all the conferences listed in, in, in Scopus, which is a very small part of the conferences. Okay, it is very little conferences. And what this shows is likes very much to go to conferences, not to EGU assemblies. Okay. Is this productive research in the East? Sure. These are the, a few. I did, uh, I did one search, and these are the top authors in the East. I blanked their names, so you cannot read uh, their names. So it's, there is quite significant amount of people which are very productive. Okay. One just have to look around. They are not coming here, but you have to find them. Okay. Why is that? It's a very simple. It's a very strong 
unconscious bias, in my view. West selects West and looks after Western interests. And what you have here is, is a list of, uh, of, let's say, the leaders of EGU in terms of board, division presidents, deputy presidents, committee chairs, and journal editors. So basically, out of 133, just one is from the East. Okay, the normal representation has to be somewhere around in between 15 and 30. So basically only, uh, basically only something like 50%, no, let me think exactly, not to make uh, any mistakes, 40% of, uh, six, sorry, only 60% of EGU is represented in the leadership positions. Okay, and the same conclusion holds for EGU participation, in EGU, for participation of East in EGU publications or EGU general assemblies, session to their tailor interest. So EGU is completely, not completely, I mean it's not completely, EGU is unconsciously biased to the West. Okay, and I put unconsciously because I don't know exactly what kind of bias is in there, but it is, it's very clear what the data say. And the main cause, in my view, is the, is the very little knowledge, Western knowledge, on the specificity of the Eastern research. EU programs and the framework and the change of the system has radically improved the, the Eastern integration towards the West. East knows West perfectly. They know because they work with them. 30% of their publication records is with the West. They know them. That's no problem. By comparison, EU programming ha have led to very little changes of the Western integration in terms of knowledge towards their Eastern colleagues. For EGU, it means that more than 30% of Europe is not represented here. I would say 40%. And uh, that's a typical test I give to everybody. Okay? How well do you know these journals? I showed this in my previous lectures. I mean, in my field, everybody would know the Journal of the Geological Society because there can be one, just one geological society, okay? <laughs> you know, like in the Immortal, the movie, there can be just one. Okay, and everybody knows International Journal of Earth Sciences, okay, Bulletin de la Société Géologique de France, uh, Swiss Journal of Geosciences. Okay, the Dutch don't care very much about the journal, okay, that's the reality. And uh, the other Western journals are well known. But how well do you know these journals? Have you heard about them? Not many people can, can say yes in this room, I think. Eh? Raise your hands. Not the Eastern people, the Western people. <laughs> OK, I'm glad. OK, very good. So there is an increase since two years ago. Now, data say there is a very, I mean, it's, there is a bias. And I think that non-representation leads to scientific nationalism in the sense that these people, they are, let's say, the Eastern people, and I can call them these people because I'm one of them. Okay, so these people, they start to do their own local organizations, they have their own meetings, and there is a very strong fragmentation now which is taking place over there. Okay, so we, are, we all love our UK colleagues, and we are all worried that they were gone. But nobody is worried that we are losing the researchers from, one, from countries that have 150 million inhabitants. Okay, so we have, to be, we have to open our eyes to see the East, because the East is not anymore the East of 1990. They are all developed countries. Well, EU 13, they are all developed countries, and the others are progressing very fast. So if you wish, I mean, I can read you this passport here, writes Unione Europeana Romania, okay? From the point of view of this passport, EGU does not represent this country. It's very simple, okay? Because there is no leadership from this country, okay? As affiliated to a Western European institution, I love both countries, okay? Because I am affiliated to the Netherlands, I can tell you that I'm as, as, uh, as guilty as anybody else of this, of this situation. Okay, so I'm, I'm also guilty. I mean, it's very simple. In a way, if you can allow me to make a joke, I think we should rename this, uh, this organization. We should call it differently. We should call it the Western European Geoscience Unions, okay, and some Eastern guests. Okay, I mean, this is why? Because there are more, there are more people in the leadership from, from Canada, Australia, United States than uh, 
than any others, than from the rest of Europe, simple. Okay, it, but in principle, EGU cannot, be, uh, cannot solve or be responsible for in imbalances in Europe, and we should not, it, but we should not blame them, okay? But we can surely play a role in bridging the scientific research across the entire Europe, okay? When the Western colleagues are aware of this situation, they tend to involve Eastern European passports, like myself, but we are working in a Western institution. We are not the solution. Okay, why? Because we don't know anything anymore about what's happening there. Research there is changing every year. So I don't know what is happening in my home country. Okay? So, and without an intentional plan, we always tend to choose our own usual suspects. I mean, who do I choose? I mean, what do I vote for the president? Ah, I know this guy, he's good, okay. So we need an intentional plan. So my suggestion is to develop an outreach and promotional plan that reaches Eastern research communities that are traditionally not targeted by the EGO. And the most important thing, in my view, is to engage research leaders affiliated to European countries. We have to f actively find them. Who are the guys which are reading the research over there? And get them involved. Bring them here at the EGU. Put them in, uh, try to give them some kind of a role. Okay, and they will bring the communities here. And then we really have an, a real European integration, in, integrated uh, association. When choosing or nominating research collaborators or leaders, remember that you always find top researcher in the East. You know them, they collaborate with you anyway. I mean, they are the guys which publish with you. I mean, simple. So, there are either consciously reduce the bias of always first choosing Western colleagues or, and, depends on the situation, fight your own implicit or explicit bias towards Eastern colleagues. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Please go to the mic. Long? Okay, we, have, we don't get kicked out yet. We have a few minutes. Um, thank you, Olivia, for your talk and your statistics. I have two questions, a comment. So questions, first of all, when you deal with your statistics, sometimes authors are affiliated with two or three institutions. Sometimes institutions in Eastern and Western in EU 15, in EU 13, how you deal with? I mean, first of all, uh, people like you and me, I consider them West. No. I mean, uh, we work in, uh, I take the, the main affiliation at the Institute. Micro, micro, please. If you want to walk around, you can use this. I'm, I'm a walker. So. Okay. so basically, in the databases, the, fir the, the first affiliation is the one which is taken into account. Okay? Okay, so th that affiliation is taken. Okay, so it's must very be simple. Some, some bias also here. So that's why it's the advantage of using this yeah. first affiliation. Yeah. Because my, I mean, yours or my potential second affiliation would be Eastern Europe, yes. Okay. Uh, my second question, because I'm involved in EGU, is when you speak about this correlation with EGU publication, do you mean publication in EGU journals or abstracts to the EGU general assembly? EGU journals. E EGU, EGU journals. journals. Really publications. Okay. I mean, real publications, yeah. yes. We have to bring our colleagues yeah. to real publications. Yeah. Yes. This is true. And my comment here, I would like uh, to share with you an initiative which is somehow mine from Western to go to Eastern part of Europe or yeah, I mean, vice we go, versa. We go together, yes. We go together, yes. It's, uh, it's EGU initiative, so EGU accepted this initiative just to bring EGU to different countries in a Geoscience Day, and this Geoscience Day will be in May in Bucharest, and our idea is over one day really to share geoscience with scientists from the country, but also with public and media, because I think what is really very important is to bring this European science to these countries, and we cannot just be here around and talking. We have to, to, to go to, to people and to, to share with them this. And I very much hope that it will be a wonderful day and we can report about next year here. 
Sure. I mean, I did not put it there because I knew that you will bring it up. So. Thank you very much for your talk. Forgive me as a latecomer to this session. To what extent do you think language is a factor in this? English is a horrible language. I am so grateful I'm a native speaker of it because I cannot communicate in science in any other language. I mean, this is a fault of the English education system. But also knowing that language is a cause of much... Um, argy-bargy. In many countries, it's a very sensitive point. And if we want to reach out to people, well, is the fact that everything here is done in English one of the major barriers? Speaking what I realized to somebody who, to whom neither their native affiliation nor their Western affiliation is in a country where English is the native language. I think uh, not, and being native in English is an advantage. But, uh, I mean, uh, English is not anymore a barrier across, across Europe, in my, in my view, in my experience. In my experience, uh, this used to be a, the case of uh, our parents. It's not the case anymore. I mean, uh, I, I, the people I speak with, the young people I speak with, the students that I work with, they all speak standard, standard English. I mean, sometimes they speak a better British English than the English. Have you had this experience? I had it. I mean, I, mean, I, had the, I have Scottish students in my classroom, and then I have, uh, let's say, uh, Spanish or whatever, French. They speak a better British English, at least the one I understand. I think we should stop going there. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes. OK, I was going to say we can ask anybody a question, but I think we have another question. You know, we have like three more minutes or four more minutes, and so if anybody has questions for any of the speakers, feel free to ask. That was a wonderful compilation. I knew you were working on this, but it's very telling. I just want to point out also from the previous question, too, that, that English really isn't a barrier. Your list of journals over there, and I can add some Polish ones with Polish titles and so on, I think I have about six papers where Eastern European people have contacted me and then they want to publish it in their, I know Geologica Gale, uh, Carpathia, I have several. And so I help them to write it. And it's sure, it's extra work, but a lot of these have been just short papers. And then they get it in their home country journal. And um, a lot of the people speak, speak English. And it's, it's pretty easy to work with them on that. So. I mean, we don't really speak a good English, most of us. But we do speak an English that you can understand us. Okay, and you don't want to even hear my New Hampshire accent. <laughs> um, any other questions to any of the speakers today? It's been really quite, you know, a very uh, interesting, eye-opening session. So, I think if we have no other questions, I think we'll give the, all the speakers one round of applause.